What's going on everybody? Thank you for tuning in to Frequency and Red Toes Live Reaction Review Part 10! We made it to Part 10. Um, might be going into 12 streams altogether. It's either going to be 11 or 12. And actually there's a possibility might be 13. Just depends on how fast I can get reviews out. But uh, welcome again. Thanks for coming in. Who we got? We got Josh Man, Williams, Walk Up. And Sonic Bomb and Vitties. Thank you for all, all of you being here. It's really cool to see uh, some con consistent viewers, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So it's really cool that you guys like these uh, these live streams. When physical media frequency, I want you to know that just for fun, I literally took your Ghost Squad review and edited the audio back in the correct order because I'm weird. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you had fun with that. Uh, fun fact: I actually have the regular version on my computer and I may upload it one day but it is there if anybody wants to see it but since you already did it I'm yeah know, I mean is there really know. any point to you uploading it now well, I mean just so it's on my channel that's about it but I wouldn't I'm not gonna do that for a while so yeah Mr. Toad and Dean how's it going guys and Nick Ray Nick Ray how's it going Hello, guys. We got, um... Oops, lost my space. Okay. Uh, yesterday, I finally did my taxes, and it <laughs> you are cutting it close. Yep. And but the reason why I did it was because I knew it would, it would barely take me any time at all, and I was right because it only took me like seventeen minutes. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> I. I mean, I, I am like, I, I just did like the very basic of what you're supposed to do. Like, mm -hmm. I, I don't, I don't have like any, you know, uh, property taxes. I don't have like any dependents or, or capital like, gains ca or I don't have capital gains tax or, or like, uh, uh, what's it called? Retirement. Or anything, anything like that. Anything. It's, it's just single income from one state that doesn't even... Uh, do like you know state taxes uh -huh. so it, it's just super short for yeah. me <laughs> i'm i i'm very lucky yeah yes you're very boring yeah i'm very boring yeah very boring yep yep and i still got uh uh like a tax return oh nice yeah cool what's up bolt mouse Unknown Garden, I don't think I've seen you here before. Hi, Frequency Ratoa. I just want to say my brother and I used to watch your vids back in the day, and these live streams have been real fun and nostalgic. Hope all is well with you all. Thank you yeah. very much. Thanks for joining. I didn't know you've been here before, but appreciate you uh, commenting. Let us know you're here. Yeah. They, they've been very nostalgic for me, too. It, it's really cool to see these reviews again. Some of these I, I'd only watched one time before, so it, it was kind of cool to... to <laughs> see them again like pretty much new reviews oh. kind of because i i had very little memory of them oh, okay how many reviews are we going to get to today um it's going to be in the 12 to 15 mark probably mm -hmm. that's that's the norm but we're starting out with, starting off with a really good one breath of the wild yeah. for the switch uh, i actually had one question mm -hmm. before we start um uh, what is what what kind of games are more fun for you to review to review specifically is it like big triple a games or like small uh relatively unknown games like ghost squad yeah kind of thing um it depends <clears throat> if it's a zelda i'm super excited but at the same time the other side of the coin it is exhausting uh reviewing that game because oh, i have like to get big so games? much i have to get so much footage uh for what i think i want to show mm. um without spoiling anything but also giving the viewers enough to be like oh yeah this is enough for a review um and I, i've told him before that usually when i review big games like that i try to go to uh, like the next game in line i try to do a simpler one an easier mm. one um just to give myself a breath of fresh air because if i start doing lots of triple a in a row or just big games in a row i get burned out and i don't yeah. want to do that again so i'm trying to uh fluctuate it so yeah that, that makes sense um i hit both those smaller games and the big games as well <clears throat> the only thing that i don't really do which um i can't really afford because 
games come out all the time is that I don't really review super relevant games. Mm. Um, yeah, you reviewed Breath of the Wild like a couple months after it released, right? Um, I believe so, yes. And same with Tears of the Kingdom. Tears yeah. of the Kingdom was exactly one month after it came oh, out. Oh, okay. And it's because it took me a month to... I played the game originally, and I was like, okay, I got it. Now I'm going to play it again and get footage. Oh. And then it took me so long to get enough footage and write it and do everything. Hmm. How does it feel watching yourselves in in the live skits? Uh, some of it, I th there are a few things where like I cringe at myself, like wow, I, I'm such a terrible actor, or wow, that joke was really lame. But uh, most of them are like, oh, that was like really fun to do. I uh, uh, some some of them I think are like legitimately funny. Um, yeah, I I I I like watching them. Okay. Hey, Bolt Mousen, um, appreciate you coming by. I know you have to work, but uh, gotta do what you gotta do. So thanks for coming in. Uh, walk up. Wait, walk up. The development team briefly considered making Zelda this game's protagonist. Oh, oh in for Breath of the Wild. For Breath of the Wild. Oh wow. Maybe like a uh, like a Phantom Zelda kind of thing. Hmm. I I think I read somewhere they uh, they considered. Um, Letting you ch it was either letting you choose between a male or female link, or uh, just going with a female link. Yeah. Like as a playable as the playable character. What I prefer? Or, I'm no. sorry, I didn't hear your question. Uh, <laughs> uh, it was not a question. It was it was just like a factoid that I, I think is a fact is the developers had considered. Uh, letting the player play as like oh, either oh, choosing oh, a male okay. or female link. Oh, oh, I remember hearing yeah. you on that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Enough talk. Let's get into the review. Here we go. It's time for the Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild review for the Nintendo Switch. Isn't that opening just beautiful? I'm not just talking about graphics. I've played through this game three times now, and every time I get to this spot, I honestly get a small dose of butterflies in my stomach because I know I'm in for a wild adventure. I'm assuming most of you who are watching this have played some sort of past Zelda game, no, these don't count. My point is, even if you've only played one Zelda title, you should have at least a basic understanding of the game's formula. Well, you can throw that out of the window, because this game takes a whole new direction. In most Zelda games, you must follow a specific gameplay path, meaning in order to advance, you're forced to complete certain scenarios in a preset order. There's very little, if not zero, freedom to change up how and or when the game progresses in the main storyline. This game removes those chains and lets you loose to do whatever, and for the most part, whenever you want to do something. The main goal is to defeat Ganon, as in many Zelda games, but the journey to that goal is entirely up to you. When you first begin, you're located on top of what's called the Great Plateau, and you're unable to leave until certain tasks have been achieved. Once completed, you're free to roam the entirety of Hyrule. If you see a peak on the horizon, you can actually go there. The only boundaries you'll find are the edges of the map, which, by the way, is absolutely huge. At the time of this video, this is the largest Zelda game ever created, and virtually all of it is within your reach. So the main goal is to defeat Ganon, but what's very interesting is that you can go fight him immediately after you exit the Great Plateau. That's right, you can head straight to the castle and test your skills. You'll most likely die, but the fact that you're able to do this just shows how much freedom you have at your fingertips. Now this doesn't mean the game abandons you completely. It will immediately nudge you in a certain direction once you leave the Great Plateau, but you don't have to go where it tells you. You'll miss certain storyline elements if you don't go, but again, it's entirely up to you. Very early in the game, you'll acquire four special runes, linked to your Sheikah Slate, a multi-purpose tool you receive while on the Great Plateau. One of the four runes is bombs, and instead of just your traditional looking round bombs, you also have cube-shaped bombs at your disposal. These come in handy when you need to place a bomb on a slope so they won't roll down the hill, and the opposite is true for the round ones. Be careful placing a round bomb on a hill, because even the slightest grade and tilt will make the bomb roll... <laughs> And roll. <laughs> Why don't you just explode it? 
part, it was partly for the Switch. Oh, okay. And roll. I, it was an accident at first, but I was like, oh, this is kind the of The other funny. great thing about okay. bombs is that you can detonate them whenever you want. Another rune is Magnesis. Here, you can use a giant magical magnet to lift and move metal objects. Great for removing treasure chests out of the water and creating metallic bridges. Another rune is Stasis. With this power, you can stop really time in the movement of any object and an enemy. If you oh, strike yeah. the object while it's stopped, you'll create a buildup of kinetic energy, and once Stasis runs out, the object will blast forward in the corresponding direction, and based on how many times you struck it and with the type of weapon you use, it will travel a certain distance. The fourth rune is Cryonis, which allows you to create up to three pillars of ice from any large enough source of water. It's nice that you can climb them, and you don't slip while walking on them. All four powers come in handy many times throughout the game. Early on, you'll receive a glider. Uh, this is one of the it. best... Oh, 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 oh. Um, I remember this shrine right here, when we were playing the game like the first couple days or whatever, um, we were going on our own path, but we were talking about it and I said, hey, th this shrine right next to the stable. I said, how did you get there? And I told you that I used um, Cryonis uh -huh. to get and jump over like you see here. And you told me that, oh, that is so cool because I didn't do that. I, I went up this ridge right here to a cliff and I jumped off and paraglided oh. into it and at the time that was so unique for yeah. a Zelda game. Yeah, it's like you can, there's multiple ways to, to get to the same yeah. destination I know, that's really I, cool. I thought, was, I thought that was awesome. It's come in handy many times throughout the game. Early on, you'll receive a glider. This is one of the best items I think in the you game did it because the way gliding down from a high point is so fun and there's, there's water, and it's a great right way there, to yeah. get from one point to the other. Like in Skyward Sword, Link has a stamina gauge. You'll use up stamina every time you sprint, climb, use a spin attack, or glide. When Link is engaged in battle, if you perform a parry or dodge an attack at just the right time, you can perform your flurry rush attack. You can also use this special technique while using your bow in the air. Once performed correctly, time will slow down around you, allowing you to strike multiple times with ease. This technique can save your life, and it's nice that there's no limit on how many times you can use it. Unlike other Zelda games, Link isn't limited to just a few primary weapons. There are many different swords, and clubs, and spears, and even elemental wands. You can find them in chests or as rewards for completing side quests, or even disarming enemies and stealing theirs. If you're holding a two-handed weapon, you won't be able to shield yourself, but most two-handed weapons deal more damage per hit than their one-handed counterparts. I say most, because there are high-tier one-handed weapons out there that can do massive damage, and you won't have to sacrifice your shield to use them. Link's bows and shields also have certain ratings. To add another level of depth to the equipment, each one has a certain amount of integrity before it will break. It's nice that a notification will pop up every time you select a brittle item, and it'll also blink red when it's about to break. Instead of using a melee weapon until its final breath, you can use the last bit of it to throw at enemies for twice the damage. <laughs> Scattered throughout the world are shrines. Once entered, you'll usually have a test to complete, and most of them have you use one or multiple slate powers. Honestly though, the good majority of shrines are too easy. It would have been nice if they were more complicated. When completed, you'll receive a spirit orb. You can exchange four orbs for either a full heart container or a stamina vessel, which will increase your maximum stamina by one-fifth of your base stamina. I appreciated that you got to choose whichever prize you wanted, because I felt that stamina vessels added more utility in the beginning. Because this game world is huge, traversing it can take a long time on foot. You can always use your Sheikah Slate to teleport to any shrine you visited, or any tower you've activated. Have you but if you want to take the scenic route, game? riding a horse is uh, a great yes. option. Mm -hmm. However, uh, you need to tame one first, no. as all the horses you can get are wild. And it's not like you can just walk up to one and hop up. Once you get on a horse, a you'll need to horse. Comet, which takes up stamina. The higher the tier of the horse, the longer it will take to tame. If you don't have much stamina, it will be very difficult to tame some horses. Once you calm one down, you can take it to any stable you find, where you'll be able to name it, Buster. get a bridle and saddle, and the best part is, oh, if your horse is within yep. hearing distance, you can whistle for it and it will come to you, as long as there's nothing in its way of getting to you. Taco. Also, if you leave your horse somewhere and are at a stable across the map, they'll still retrieve it for you. As you travel throughout, you'll find many showed, items to collect, such as weapons and equipment, different vegetation and oh, small really? animals <laughs> and insects, precious jewels, and even monster parts you can obtain by defeating enemies. Much of what you can collect can be cooked into dishes, or even elixirs. Cooked food can give you more than just hearts. If you cook with the right combination of ingredients, you can create some great dishes that can give you temporary boosts to your attributes, such as increased attack or defense, increased speed, or even more hearts than your maxed amount. Trying different combinations is fun, but be careful, as some items don't mix well with each other, and you can't mix multiple items that would give different attribute bonuses, otherwise you'll end up with a nasty flop, and you'll have wasted those ingredients.
When you first start, Link will have on a basic set of clothes, which doesn't offer much protection when in a fight. Throughout the world, you'll find different sets of clothing and armor to offer you better resistance, but most are pretty pricey. You'll need to save up your rupees in order to pay for all of them. Fortunately, you can sell just about anything you can find. Some merchants will give you more rupees than others, but Beetle is usually pretty fair with his prices. This is the first Zelda game to have full voice acting. I'll admit, it was a bit odd to hear some of the characters speak, but I think it works for the most part. Link doesn't speak though, and I think this was the smarter move. The weather can affect your gameplay. If it's raining out, even if it's just a light shower, your wall climbing abilities will be crippled. You'll slide on the wall a lot, and yeah, you'll get frustrated easily. When there's a lightning storm, you can get electrocuted if you have any metallic items out. If you're caught in a fight oh, while there's a storm, cool. you'll have to use non-metallic items to fend off your foes. That was so cool. Harsh temperatures yeah. can affect Link as well. Specific foods and elixirs can protect you from extreme cold and heat, but certain sets of clothing can do the same thing. I thought it was so cool how if you're in an environment with extreme heat, any wooden items you have out will start to burn up. Regular arrows will instantly turn into fire arrows, and bomb arrows... <laughs> well, don't use them here. The graphics are just beautiful. Nintendo stuck with Skyward Sword's style of visuals, but the Switch's HD capabilities makes it even better. Everything is aesthetically pleasing, and some of those sunsets are just breathtaking. The controls work nicely, however it might take you a bit to get used to. The button mapping isn't like traditional Zelda games. I especially like the quick select menus for equipping different weapons and shields. Oh, and if you haven't noticed yet, Link can actually jump on command with a simple press of X. There's so many things to talk about, and most of them are good, however there are some things I wish were different. Even though it's handy to have a quick select menu for equipment, it would have been nice to have the option to drop an item within this menu for convenience, rather than having to open up the full inventory and select an item. This is especially oh, the case when you open a chest, the find though, a weapon right? you oh. want to keep, but have to put it they back in the video, chest because like, oh, your inventory I, I didn't is full. Even realize that open was up a new your feature. inventory, yep. drop a weapon, then reopen the chest and get the item. This happens way more often than you might think. There were two gameplay glitches I came across. The frame rate was usually consistent, however there were some areas of slowdown, and enemies, for the most part, had some sense of AI, however sometimes examples like this would happen, which broke up the continuity. For how large the game world is, there aren't that many boss fights. Now that's not a bad thing, as I feel this game is more about exploration and planning your own adventure, than have a checklist of what to do next, which includes defeating a handful of bosses. You honestly don't have to fight any of them to complete the game. It's fun though, as one of them in particular, I feel, will really test your mettle. To get to a boss fight, you'll need to overcome this game's versions of dungeons, which aren't dungeons at all. Instead, you'll find yourself within a divine beast, a giant mechanical leviathan. The closest example I can think of is Lord Jabu Jabu in Ocarina. However, there's a new twist, and in some cases, a literal twist to these sections. Once you reach a point within every beast, you're able to take some control over it and move sections of it, which changes the map and passageways you're able to use. And this isn't some small feature, the main puzzle is the divine beast itself. The only complaint I had with these is that they aren't that complicated. I know there's limited physical space within each beast, so wishing there was more to explore within each one isn't exactly fair to say. So instead, I'll say that I wish there were more puzzles in each one to make the experience more challenging. I wish I could go on and talk about the long list of elements and features and just awesome things this game has to offer, like the many different biomes, the unique and funny characters, the beautiful music, the gameplay physics themselves, the many hidden <laughs> treasures and side quests to find and complete. It just goes that on and on. The game feels very rewarding when you complete a task, and every time you enter a new area, your level of excitement and wonder resets as you don't know what you might find. Every Zelda game I've played in the past has always given me a certain level of adventurous spirit. However, most had the same overall linear gameplay design, which, don't get me wrong, isn't a bad thing, but I wasn't opposed to the idea of changing the Zelda formula up when Nintendo first talked about this game. And wow, did they ever pull it off! Is this the best Zelda game ever made? Well, that's kind of an unfair question. Since this game doesn't follow the traditional Zelda formula, how can you really compare it? If we're talking about the traditional Zelda games, I think Majora's Mask holds that title, with Wind Waker just barely underneath it. I will say this, when Nintendo decides to create a new Zelda game, they'll have their work cut out for them, as this game sets a new bar. It will be thrilling to see what they can come up with for our favorite unspoken hero, but for now, you shouldn't have any hesitation to picking this game up and having your own wild adventure. This game gets a 4.75 out of 5 with the title of Epic.
need yeah. carrots. Bring right carrots. Bring right carrots. I need carrots right now. Uh, I got the soup. Oh. Oh. One more order of the soup. I need okay. carrots right now. It's gonna burn. Okay, they're right uh, here. One more order of the soup. One more potato. I got a potato right here. Right here. Guys, we need more potatoes. I got potatoes right here. Go, go, go. Go, 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 go. <laughs> that was fun to yeah. coordinate. It it took a bit because we don't we didn't storyboard it, but it was still fun. Yeah. Uh, that you know I really like that review. Um, you showed like so much of, of the game. Mm -hmm. Uh, may, maybe it's a little spoilery, but uh, what was spoilery about it? Well, it, it w wasn't so much as like story spoilers, but like um like surprising uh environmental hmm. things in the game like you showed the that dark area that's like almost pitch black uh you showed the dragon i i mean i don't know i i i, I don't i don't think i would say it's a bad thing that you showed so much but it 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 shows that uh you um experienced a lot of what the game has to offer so uh you're kind of coming at it with a a sense of experience like like you have you you have you can trust w uh what you're saying about the game because you you've just experienced so much of mm. it i i try to show a good level not a spoiler level but a good level of mm. diversity uh diversification of environments yeah. in a game like this and you know i didn't that that one little clip of the the dark area. I mean, that was what three seconds yeah. long. I mean, it's just a taste of it. It was pretty cool going into it blind and like finding out that was a thing, though. Yeah, yeah, that was cool. But yeah, I I really like that review. You you went into detail. You went into detail about a lot of uh, mm -hmm. a lot of aspects of the game. Maybe we should scroll up to see earlier I, I saw one from, I think it was Dean Gavitt said that one of the original uh, pitch ideas for that game was uh, Aliens Invade Hyrule. And a oh. working title was like uh, Legend of Zelda Invasion. Oh, I remember. Yeah, I, I think I remember seeing like uh, concept art for that. I, I, don't, I don't know how I feel about it because they've done it so for so long forever that it's kind of like a medieval fantasy kind mm -hmm. of thing then you're you're gonna go into sci-fi i don't know i, I if they're gonna do that it should be a whole new ip together mm. yeah. oh have you seen um uh i forgot what it was i i it, I guess it it might have been like a oh it was Waka who said that oh it might have been a uh, game developers conference uh, presentation, uh, but the developers showed footage of this uh, build of the original Legend of Zelda, but they kind of added uh, like uh, mechanics into the overworld that they would later use for uh, Breath of the Wild. It, I think they they developed that little that little. Uh, tech demo uh just to see uh, as like a proof of concept okay like it, it would work like this in in a 2d game but uh how, how would we translate that into a 3d game so in in their little tech demo thing they they had like uh envir uh little tiles that could be set on fire and then the wind could blow the fire over to other tiles hmm. um it, it was uh, have you ever seen that before mm -hmm. it, it's really interesting hmm. Fans sometimes claim Breath of the Wild takes place in a period where the split timelines of the previous game have reemerged based on official materials that the, that showed in broad. Yeah, that's what I've broad heard. Broad box below. Yeah, I've seen that before. Um, really, the whole official timeline is it, it's whatever to me anymore. It, it it's so inconsistent. I I don't think the the developers even really care. They don't care, or they they just don't put very much priority no. into the timeline. I don't know about any of you, but I am hoping the next Zelda, or at least a future Zelda, is a prequel to Majora's Mask. I want to know, uh, like, Fierce Deity and Majora Origins. I think that'd be mm. really fun. I doubt they would ever do that. 
because they're they're way more concerned about uh like novel gameplay mechanics first and then story is just kind of a then then a new it has to have a new director then it, it can't be mm-hmm. um well, <laughs> i can't remember his oh, name uh, the current director uh i can't remember it either it's, anyway, it's kind of a weird anyway name. it has to be a new director then it, it can't be the same guy Aonuma. Aonuma, yeah. yeah. And or Miyamoto can't be involved either. Yeah, E.J. Yeah, Aonuma. Mm-hmm. So. Okay. Let's get on to the next review. Overcooked Special Edition. This was a surprisingly yeah, good game. Yeah, th- this game was so much fun because all four of us, uh, there came a point when we all just kind of worked together like a machine. Mm-hmm. We were all parts of a, of a working machine. It was really cool. Yeah. See you later, Bolt Mouse. Thanks for coming by. It's time for the Overcooked Special Edition review for the Nintendo Switch. Now, I actually didn't plan on this happening, but I think this is a great review for Thanksgiving. Yes, for the fact that there's a lot of food, but also because of the lovely chaos and stress that comes about when you get together with family. This game could have just been called The Emotional Essence of Thanksgiving Day, because oh boy, this game can draw some similarities to how it is when family gets together. The story is about how you, and anyone you're playing with, go back in time in order to hone your chef skills so you can save the Onion Kingdom with said chef skills. Don't worry, the story's not important for the sake of the review. It's not worthless though, as it's cute and gives the game more charm. The game thrives as a terrific local multiplayer party game. It's best to have four players at once, however three isn't bad either. Each stage is basically a restaurant, however virtually all of them have some sort of twist, and it's everyone's job to figure out the best method of producing tasty dishes for the customers as fast as you can. Creating each dish requires following specific instructions. Putting together a works hamburger isn't just slapping a patty on a bun with lettuce and tomato. Mm -hmm. You need to find where each ingredient is on the map and prepare them. You need to put the buns on the plate, tenderize the beef, put the beef patty in the pan, take out some lettuce, slice it up, put it on the bun, take out a tomato, slice it up, put it on the bun, retrieve the patty before it burns, put it on the bun, and take the whole thing to the delivery. That was a really good uh, sequence. Each item on the menu isn't complicated, but trying to coordinate with your fellow chef is the real challenge. Everyone should be working on something at all times, and figuring out what everyone else is doing so you can figure out what you need to do can be very complicated. It's best not to work on something someone else is already doing, but the challenge is that most jobs change up quickly due to a handful of factors. Sometimes the dish is done, sometimes the map itself changes up so you're limited in what you can do, but the most common thing to mess you up is the list of orders themselves. The orders are placed at the top of the left screen, with the corner order being the oldest. The The biggest problem with this is that the orders are not numbered or color coordinated. It's extremely easy to get lost, and figuring out which orders need to be worked on while trying to figure out I, I which orders like are that. already oh, really? being worked I on can be a huge challenge. Communication the with your fellow chefs is the key to winning each level. Okay. Mushroom up here. Oh, that one is crazy. Second mushroom. I need a third tomato. I'll get the third tomato. Where's the tomatoes? Okay. I got it. Okay. I'm gonna work on the next mushroom. Oh, uh, okay. You got first mushroom. I got second mushroom. I got third mushroom. It's very beneficial if someone takes the lead in following the orders, but even then, it's not exactly easy because they can't just be standing there and watching the orders, they need to help by completing them as well. It takes practice, but once you find a system that works, it feels so satisfying when the kitchen becomes one well-oiled machine. When the timer runs out on each level, you'll be graded from 0 to 3 stars, which is based on how many points you receive during the level. More stars earned means more levels and characters unlocked. And yes, everyone wanted to be the character that looked like Buster. (laughs) There isn't more than just a cosmetic value to each character, but it's still fun. The graphics and controls are simple, yet effective. It's nice that one button wasn't mapped for all of the actions. Picking up something and chopping something are controlled by two different buttons. It's also nice that you only need one Joy-Con per person to play. I think the biggest surprise of the game was the music. Some of these songs sound like they were composed for a AAA title. Reminds me a lot of Super Mario Galaxy. That level was pretty fun. Yeah. There is single player mode, but the game is just not worth it if you're buying it for yourself. You can switch between two chefs in the kitchen so you're not running around everywhere with one character, but actions take much longer, and it's just not that much fun in general. In competitive mode, you'll face off against your friends to see who can produce more dishes in a given time. This mode is way more fun when there's four players. Because this is the Switch version, all the DLC is included, which means more maps and characters to unlock, which is always nice. 
There's no online mode, which I at first that, thought was a downside. That one was But I realized great. a lot of trolling and miscommunication uh, I don't think I like that could one. happen, especially if you couldn't talk with each other. However, it would have been nice to at least play with friends online using multiple switches. Overcooked Special Edition is a fantastic party game and just an overall good addition to the Switch's library. While it lacks in gameplay and just downright fun in single player mode, it more than makes up for it when you have more people playing. If you're looking for a great yet chaotic party game, look no further than this quirky gem. This game gets a 4 out of 5 with the title of Awesome. Have a happy Thanksgiving. Uh, oh, if we had to get 300 on oh, this, man. man. Oh! oh. <laughs> called Smash Chasm and every character in the show had this this username like like Smasher64 or Blackberry and I thought it was so cool because I'm a stupid kid and so what I thought what if I was in the show and I had a name like that and so uh you know what I'm, I'm just gonna play the game What are you doing on my computer? Wait, no, wait. Um, this is a rank match. No, I, I don't no. Care. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta come up with more videos like that. I, I like to use multiple shot videos, reaction videos. Hey, reaction. I've always wanted to try Overcooked, but I don't have people to play with. Well, aren't the new ones that are out, don't they have, like, online play? I think you can do that now. It's just that version you couldn't. Mm. Overcooked is, like, I guess you could say it's a party game, but with with how much you really have to, like, lock in and uh, ha get... You have to, like, really focus and have super good communication with, with everyone... Mm -hmm. It's not really something that you can just, oh yeah, everyone can just kind of play. No. It's, it's, you all have to be cooperating and communicating and focusing, you know. There's very few games that we like to play with our mom mm. and that she enjoys playing. And we tried oh, Overcooked. Yeah. And she just like, couldn't do it. In 30 seconds, she's like, I I'm too stressed. Yeah. I don't want to do it. It was way too overwhelming. Yeah. Too bad because it's a fun game, but mm -hmm. I understand. Is the red toe apart the bionicle? Yeah. Yes. The the whole hint is his name. Yeah. Oh, although in your in that skit when you say um, I'll just play the game. That that is kind of awkward, don't you think? Because it's like you're you're asking what is red toa, uh, which kind of implies that you don't know what a what a toa is. Yeah. So I'm gonna find out in the game. But. But how did how would you know that a Toa is a Bionicle? It, you're thinking way too deep into this. It, it's like, oh, I just heard it, and I, I know it's from the Bionicle universe. Okay. I just don't know what it is. So, oh, okay. your name just happens to be that. Hmm. James. Hey, how you fellas doing? Doing well, James. Thanks for coming by. I don't think I've seen you in the chat before, so if this is your first time, welcome. Where is he? I don't see him. Oh, Jay there. there he is. McFwee is his name? Uh, or Micklefwee? I can't really see from here. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. All right, let's get to the review. It's time for the Bionicle review. For the game Man, you got this game. Now I didn't like, really play with Legos growing what? up, let alone Bionicles. Like My brother did, I however, did? and that's where he got yeah. his name. No, I just uh, never had an interest in this stuff. So going into this game, I I never played this game before. 
Uh, I did have I'm thinking a, of a t- different game. I, than... I did have a uh, a choice between like I remember it was when I was a kid. I went to GameStop and I I had enough money to get one game, and I was deciding between this game and Wario Land Two on the Game Boy Color, and I I chose Wario Land mm. over this. Yeah, you chose the better one. I guess, I guess so. <laughs> James. But I re- as a kid, I really wanted to get this oh. game. James says it's pronounced McElwee. Okay. Game, I didn't really have any kind of expectation. Now, if you're like me, where you don't know anything about this universe, that can be a bit of a problem, because you have to be a fan of Bionicles to understand most of what's going on in the game. It's definitely geared towards kids who know what the characters are talking about. The game is a third-person action-adventure, with seven levels total. Each one has an elemental theme. Fire, water, earth, you get the idea. In each level, you'll control one of six Toas associated with the theme of the level. It sounds cool, as each Toa has the power over a specific element, so you'd think you get to pull off some cool fire or ice or wind attacks, but alas, it's just not so. Each Toa controls the same, with the same attacks. The attacks aren't even elemental based. All you get to do is shoot projectiles from your melee weapons. Your weapons might as well be guns, because you can't use them for actual melee combat. The only difference in character control is with the water Toa, you can swim underwater, and with the air Toa, you can glide for a few seconds. These differences were appreciated to break up the monotony, but it's not enough to pull your mind away from the static drab of lackluster vanilla gameplay. Each level has you progressing from point A to B, all the while fending off enemies which are more annoying than threatening, picking up dozens of orbs, and once in a while solving easy puzzles. Now I know the game is meant for kids, but I don't see how anyone who's not a fan, or at least indifferent to this universe, can find enough enjoyment to venture through all it has to offer, which isn't much. Luckily, some levels change things up. In one level, you're riding on a minecart trying to unlock a handful of locks while avoiding obstacles, and in another, you're racing down a mountain via snowboard trying to beat a foe from reaching a village first. The majority of levels, though, have you on foot with simple objectives to complete. The whole game will take you just a couple hours to complete. That said, it would probably take you even less time if it weren't for the camera and some of the mechanics in general. The camera can be controlled by the right shoulder button and also the C-Stick. The problem is that the auto camera fights with you a lot. Many times I'll be in situations where the camera wants to show me a specific angle of where to go next, but wanting to adjust it to your preference can be more of a challenge than the main objective in the level. A handful of times I came across situations, especially in this win level, where I needed to jump quickly or else I'd fall to my death, but my character wouldn't respond when I needed him to. Other times he would glide over too far a distance. When you try to get him to stop gliding, he'll continue for like half a second, then he'd stop, which would make me overshoot my landing spot. Also, this stupid bird part was such a pain. You're supposed to follow him, but his turns are so fast without warning, and staying within the width of updrafts can be very difficult. This part only lasts about 10 to 15 seconds, but it seriously took me around 30 attempts to finally reach the end. Seriously, dang. The graphics are nothing special. It doesn't look bad for GameCube, but it really could have used a touch-up or two. The few boss battles that it has are just like the enemies you find in each level, more annoying than challenging. Predictable patterns are easy to memorize, and defeating them just makes you glad you know you're getting near the end of the game. There's no reward for beating them other than the fact you can progress further in the story. The sound design and audio mixing in general were in serious need of polishing. Almost every song and sound effect sounded muted, and many times the music would just stop, and then like 30 seconds later it would start up again. Some of the cutscenes didn't have any sound effects where it really needed them. Yeah, no footsteps. Yeah, that's awkward. Uh... No slashing sound. It's like watching a silent the voice movie acting with was an orchestra. Okay. The... Yeah. Can't really judge it harshly, as the core demographic watching it won't care. All I'll say is it's fine for kids. The orbs you find in the levels will allow you to unlock bonus content, if you care enough to do so. With such potential the world of Bionicle can offer for a video game, this one just fell short of being good. It's not a terrible game, but one that feels unfinished. It doesn't feel rushed, as it doesn't really have bugs, but so much Eh, more could have been done with it to give players a more fun experience. Only if you're a true fan of this world will you maybe want to play this. For everyone else, you're not missing out on anything. This game gets a 2 out of 5 with the title of 4. I think I probably still would have liked it as a kid oh, if yeah. I played it. <laughs> no sound effects makes it look so awkward. Wait. No, it's it's catch 'em all. Why am I thinking snack? 
Oh. This was the first uh, review f as a reward for the Risky Coins Challenge. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. That's right. I remember that. A better Bionicle game, in my opinion, was Bionicle Heroes for GameCube. That was very much like the original Lego IP games. Oh, really? Okay. Jane says, I tried playing Animal Crossing New Leaf, but life simulation games are not my cup of tea. Mm. That's fine. Um, every Animal Crossing game I've played, and I think you can attest to it, you get about three months in, and then that's enough. Yep. There's there's not much incentive left, especially with uh, the newest one, uh, New Horizons, mm -hmm. that came out. It, it's fine. I like the, all the creativity options you can do, but after I set my island to what I want it to be, Eh, yeah. Uh, nothing else really interested me. I think I I remember playing Wild World Wild World for a long time, uh. But yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I honestly I think the original Animal Crossing on GameCube, where you, me, and Espeon played all together, uh, I think that was the one we played the most. Mm. Uh, Cause I remember I think I got it in late spring, and we played up until at least September or October. Yeah. Yeah, that one was really fun. I really like the sound effects in that game, too. Mm -hmm. Now, if if a, if a new Animal Crossing comes out and it's more of a... Uh, like a city builder kind hmm. of thing, I would be interested in that. A city builder? That'd be interesting. Animal Crossing that, t or or just one that takes place in a city. That'd be interesting. Yeah, because like you got your own island and everything, but what if you could make an entire community, grow an entire community? Mm. I think that'd be kind of cool. I have uh, City Skylines on PS4, which is kind of awkward to control because it's really for PC. But I like that whole Sim Town, Sim City, City Skylines kind of gameplay. All right, let's get to Pokey Derps. It's time for the Pokemon XD Gale of Darkness review for the GameCube. Before I start, I'd just like to say congratulations to Pixel Hat Pros, for he was one of the winners of my first Mario Maker challenge, therefore he got to choose a game for me to review, and here it is. I will be doing more Mario <laughs> Maker challenges in the future, so stay tuned. Uh, I, I'm, I'm glad that I did the Risky Coins challenge when I did, and I got this game out or the review out when I did because I bought this game for. What are you doing? I'm trying to use this ball as a, an ottoman, but it it's too wiggly. Um, I bought this game for like I think sixty dollars used, and now it's up in the one hundred and fifty to two hundred range. Oh my! So gosh. it would have been so expensive for me to wow. To do. Wait, sorry, you, you, you bought this for how much? Sixty. Yeah, that's a pretty cheap price for this game. Mm -hmm level in Pokemon is that of a roller coaster ride. I was super into it when I was in my single digit years and through some of my teen years. However, once I was in the middle of high school, my interest dropped to nearly zero and I wasn't interested in Pokemon until Pokemon Go came out, but that quickly faded away after about three months or so. The last Pokemon game I bought, besides this one, at the time of this video was Alpha Sapphire. I do enjoy playing TCG once in a while, as well as battling my brother with actual physical cards. So as of right now, I'd say I have a moderate interest level for the Pokemon universe. I'm saying all of this so you will understand that this review will be coming from someone who isn't a hardcore fan, nor a casual player. Gale of Darkness is the sequel to Pokemon Coliseum. I've never played Coliseum, so I didn't have an expectation for this game. The story is about how your character must save the Ore region from the nefarious team Cypher, who want to capture Pokemon, turn them into Shadow Pokemon, and use them to do their evil bidding. Shadow Pokemon used to be regular Pokemon, but have had their hearts artificially closed. Basically, they've been brainwashed. This is the main element of catching Pokemon for your team. Turkey Instead and Instead of cheese. traditional games mm -hmm. where you can find wild Pokemon, Shadow Pokemon are presented to you almost any time you fight a member of Cypher. With your Snag Machine, you can use any kind of Pokeball to try and catch and steal them away from Cypher. Snagging Shadow Pokemon is only half the battle. Once captured, you'll need to start purifying them if you want them to return to normal. You don't have to purify Pokemon, but you'll definitely want to, as Shadow Pokemon cannot level up, only learn a specific set of moves, and complications can arise when battling with them. 
There are several different ways to purify a shadow Pokemon, but the fastest way is just to battle with them. A purple gauge will start to turn white, and when it's completely white, you can take it to a special location and have it purified. Another way to purify it is to set it in the purification chamber. This eases the burden of having to purify multiple shadow Pokemon at once, but it can be complicated as you need to have correct regular Pokemon in order to speed up the process. Still, it is nice to have, and you can purify up to 9 shadow Pokemon at once. Now it is possible to catch wild Pokemon for your team, but it's unlike the core games. There are three different spots in the region where you can bait Pokemon with food, and after you leave the spots for a while, you'll receive notifications that wild Pokemon have appeared. If you're quick enough to go to the correct spot, you'll find random wild Pokemon. Catching them is a bit more difficult than you might think, because you can't run their HP down to zero, yet in order to get their HP down low enough so they won't escape a Pokeball, you'll need to use light attacks, which can be frustrating because your Pokemon are at a much higher level. This way of catching wild Pokemon is interesting, but not really that fun, because you have very little control of which Pokemon will show up, and if you're not quick enough, they will leave before you get there. Snagging shadow Pokemon is more fun, because most of them actually put up a fight, and it's easier to run into a shadow Pokemon than a wild one. The graphics look really good for this time period. It reminds me of a better looking Digimon world for the PS1. Attacks have good special effects, and the models for all Pokemon look well done. The controls are simple, basic, and easy. Moving your character around and pressing A to interact with the world around you is all it takes, and then it's even easier when in battle, as all you do is select options from a list of commands. I think a major flaw with the game overall is the difficulty of most battles. 9 out of 10 times I can breeze through a match no problem. I know this is determined by which Pokemon you have for battle, but even when at a disadvantage, I would rarely feel like I was going to lose the duel, and even rarer when I actually did lose. Most battles have you dueling with two Pokemon against two others. This makes it more complicated, as sometimes you can hurt one of your Pokemon with the attack of the other, but it's still a bit too easy to win matches, and therefore becomes tedious and boring. There are battles with only one Pokemon at a time, but the vast majority of the game, especially in the main story, has you battling with two at a time. This next part is very subjective and even conflicting for me. The game is very kid-friendly, as it was designed to be. There's nothing wrong with that, but it doesn't appeal to me that much. I think I would enjoy this game more if I had played it when it first came out. However, perhaps not, as I was in high school when this game was released. There are several different multiplayer options, which Mr. is Mr. Toe's going crazy with the, the Pokemon multiplayer names. Mode has you and a friend all my, each other my, team, oh, yeah. my team is a turkey it's sandwich. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But using your own team would be better. Fortunately, you can, for a price. It's possible to load your team from Pokemon Ruby, Sapphire, Emerald, Fire Red, and Leaf Green. In order to do so, you need Game Boy to GameCube adapters, plus of course a copy of one of the listed games, which I don't have, so I wasn't able to test this part. It is still nice that you have this option though. Pokemon Gale of Darkness isn't a bad game, but your level of Pokemon interest can play a major factor on how much you'll enjoy it. The campaign is pretty long, which is nice, but I honestly got bored with it nearly 20 hours in. It's just not the type of game I would voluntarily play. It has good things going for it, but for someone like me, who has a moderate interest level for the Pokemon universe, I would rather play core Pokemon games. I didn't really care for the way you capture Pokemon for your team, I thought most of the battles were too easy, and because it's so kid-friendly, it doesn't appeal to me as, say, Lord of the Rings The Third Age did, both being turn-based RPGs. I think bigger Pokemon fans would enjoy this more than I did, but if you have a moderate interest in Pokemon like me, or if you ever wanted to get into Pokemon and haven't, it'd be best to stick with the core games, and come to this only if you really want to experience one of the different ways to play Pokemon. This game gets a 3.5 out of 5, with the title of Good. Man, the, the animations look really good, but... The, the animations look really good in that game, but the, the it just looks really slow. Yeah, um, it, it there's not a lot of excitement for me. Like, anyway. it, it, I I think if you could like speed up the the battle animations of that game, it it wouldn't look as tedious. Mm -hmm. Um, that was one of the hardest games to review for me mm. because Pokemon is such is so successful people love it and i'm coming in to review it and i'm like a casual fan mm. of it so it's hard to not like upset a lot of people but at the same time i'm not gonna over embellish my feelings towards the game mm. it's like here you go this is my review uh we have a new person tra tra travelopolis Finally caught one of these streams. You were one of the first YouTubers back in the day and introduced me 
to and got me into watching reviews and retrospectives. Always loved your intros, by the way. Oh, thank you very much, and thank you for coming to the stream. I appreciate it. Dean Gavin, honestly, I never got into Pokemon. I'm not really sure why. Now that I'm 25, it feels weird to try and get into Pokemon. I'm not trying to shame adult mm -hmm. fans. Is there? Well, honestly, the adult fans are the ones who grew up with it yeah. in the 90s. Um, if, I, I can understand that, uh, but if I could recommend a game to, to get into, I, I want to say prob uh, probably Black and White 2. Uh, which is sounds kind of counterintuitive because you'd think you you'd want to start with black and white, but honestly, I think black and black two and white two are much better games, or uh, Heart Gold and Soul Silver. Yeah, yeah, I mean th those are like the best games in the series, uh, but specific, uh, but like specifically for like a new, like a new. Uh, uh, for a player who's never who has no experience with the game, uh, that I think I think those are good games mm -hmm. to start with. I I really enjoyed Soul Silver, and I I really enjoyed uh, X as well. Mm, yeah, X was fun. Um, I I don't think I I really like Black and White, but the the beginning is such a drag. It, it's super slow that uh, newcomers I I don't think they would uh they would stick with it. Mm. Okay. Black Black and White Two is much better at. <clears throat> I, I don't. I don't think I ever played those. Okay, let's get to Wario World. <clears throat> Wario World. It's time for the Wario World review for the GameCube. Before I start, I'd just like to say congratulations to Mario Batali Jr. for he was the second winner in my Mario Maker Risky Coins Challenge, therefore he got to choose a game for me to review, and here it is. Stay tuned for more Mario Maker challenges in the future. See you later, James. I don't have Thanks much experience with Wario games. I know there's quite a few out there, but really I've only played WarioWare, Wario Land Shake It, and a tiny bit of Wario Land 2 for the Game Boy, so I really didn't know what to expect from this game. The story is about how one of the jewels Wario found on one of his treasure hunts is actually an evil spirit and uses its powers to turn Wario's treasure collection into monsters and also morphs Wario's castle into four different worlds. The game is a 3D beat-em-up platformer. Every world consists of two levels, each with a boss fight at the end and then a final end boss when you complete the two levels. Each level is basically the same. Start at point A, get to point B, all the while defeating enemies and finding treasures scattered throughout. Every defeated enemy will drop gold coins for pickup, and you can either walk over them or use your hypersuction technique to suck up any coins relatively close to you, that which is a so very weird trick. Finding treasures is more difficult than one might think. Each treasure piece can be found in a chest, but making these chests huh, available is funny. the key. As you make your way through, you'll come across different colored buttons, which when activated, will produce a chest for you on a colored corresponding spot, but you'll usually have to search for it further in the level. Sometimes finding chests isn't so easy, as there are quite a few branching paths and optional areas to explore, which is definitely welcomed, as linear gameplay can be too easy and boring. There are other things to collect, such as pieces of a gold Wario statue, which, once all pieces in a level are found, your total health will increase by half a heart. There's also special red gems to find, but these aren't optional. In order to fight the boss at the end of each level, you'll need a certain amount of these gems to access the fight. The gems can be found in sublevels, which are accessed via trap doors scattered throughout each level. There are two different types of sublevels. One type has you trying to figure out how to reach a gem in a small room, while the other type has you trying to get to a gem by traversing different platforms with specific variables and hazards. The early sublevels are quite easy, but the later ones can make you pull your hair out with frustration. There aren't many excessive sublevels, so in order to access the boss fight, you'll have to play some of these areas with high accuracy and patience. To help you along with your quest, you can find and free trap spritelings. These little imps will give you Tree tips freaks. and clues about the worlds to help huh. ease your journey, but for me, freeing them is a catch-22. I want to free them so I can 100% the game, but they often give downright spoilers on how to pursue certain situations. Hmm. I'd like to be able to figure it out myself, you know? If you don't want any help, close your eyes and keep pressing A until the dialogue is over. Fighting enemies is fun in the beginning, but it got monotonous later down the road. Sometimes I would just bypass enemies altogether. It would have been more fun if there was some sort of upgrade or new move system in order to keep things from going stale. I would have gladly spent coins to have this. Another problem is the enemies themselves, or more specifically, the lack thereof. 
There's quite a handful of different looking enemies, but a different model is the only thing, well, different. Most of the flying enemies are the same, all the tank enemies are the same, all the club wielding enemies are the same, you get the picture. Taking enemies out isn't difficult either. Time consuming maybe, but difficult? Eh, not so much. The graphics are mediocre at best. This would have looked great on the N64, but not the GameCube. While there's a good color palette, and it does look good aesthetically, textures look pixelated, and much of it just reminds me of the N60 cube. The controls are easy to work with, except Wario's movement feels too abrupt when you start to accelerate with him. It doesn't feel natural, like it does when controlling Mario. This can cause frustrating deaths, especially in sublevels. Working with his moveset, though, is easy and makes battles fun. While the boss fights were interesting, I'll give them that, and a bit fun, most are way too easy. I really only had trouble with one of them, and that was just because I was overthinking the situation. Most of the game is quite easy, and it makes it even easier that you can continue exactly where you left off if you died by spending a relatively minuscule amount of coins. The game showers you with oh, gold, only you'll never run out. out. It's quite rare when you actually need to spend gold to bring yourself back, because enemies don't do huh. that much damage per hit, and there are multiple garlic dispensers throughout each level, which, for a super low price, can restore your health by one heart per garlic. I think if the cost of buying garlic and pain to bring yourself back to life was increased by a factor of 10, it would make the game more challenging, but in a good, if not better way. You'd be more cautious, and would possibly have to strategize on whether or not you can afford to buy garlic, or save it just in case you needed an extra life. There is another way to lose coins, and that's if you fall down a pit, you'll end up in Unithorn's lair, where touching the water or getting chewed on by a Unithorn will deplete your bank, but it's not difficult to escape this area. Apparently you can connect your Game Boy to download WarriorWare microgames, but I'm unable to test this due to lack of uh, hardware. Game Boy it is cool to have this possibility Not though. Wario World <laughs> is an average beat-em-up platformer that offers an afternoon of silly fun. While there's a good amount to find and collect throughout, the game is very short. It took me roughly 7 hours to complete. It could have been so much better with an upgrade system, at least double the amount of levels, and more variety in enemies. Because of the lack of difficulty, for the most part, I think this would be great for younger gamers, but experienced players will probably want more out of it. This game gets a 3 out of 5 with the title of Passable. I remember seeing commercials for this game when it was coming out. Mm. I remember working at GameStop and seeing it. I thought the cover art was so cool. Mm. Obvious hand. <laughs> Not all of them are super cryptic. Yeah. Um, Nick, hold on. Nick Ray, this was a review. I was very much, I very much disagree with you on. I mm. love this game and found it so good. That's totally fine. Not, I'm glad we don't have the same opinion. The world would be very boring. Um, it, it's interesting that that game had a live system where you can like spend coins to, to like revive because. That's the. I'm pretty sure that's the system that Mario Odyssey had, right? You could, or it was like every time you died, you lost like a few coins, right? Was it coins or some other currency? It was coins you lost. Yeah. And yeah, that's interesting because when when Mario Odyssey was coming out, I thought I remember hearing people say, "Oh, this is like a new innovative system that Nintendo has never done before. It it like completely fixes the archaic." Uh, extra live system, but like Wario, Wario World, Wario World. That's that's the name of it. That's the name of it, right? Wario yeah. World. Yeah, Wario World did that like, like twenty years ago. That's cr that's kind of <clears throat> interesting. Maybe or ten, fifteen. I don't know, fifteen years ago, I guess. Um, <clears throat> for me, what would have made the game so much more fun is if there was an upgrade, uh, upgradable combat system. Mm. It, it needed something to keep things fresh because by like stage three or four it just like it, it's the same stuff and even the enemies they're they're the same hmm. they're just uh aesthetically different yeah gamecube was pretty experimental uh that that whole generation was <laughs> was so good f-zero existing <laughs> f-zero yeah <laughs> Yeah, the the whole generation of games was just is pro probably the best uh, 
pioneering days? Yeah, I don't know, just kind of best in general, really. Really? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. The, the, the games that came out back then were just like... Really good. Just pro some of the best games ever made. Yeah. You know, it was interesting, the two reviews we just watched, Pokemon and World World, those were both requested from the Risky, Risky Coins Challenge. Yeah. They were both GameCube requests. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And I was thinking about this in the two videos ago. It, I Isn't it kind of interesting how the guy requested, like, one of the most expensive GameCube games uh, I know, to review? I know. <clears throat> Dang, he, he really asked a lot out of you, I, huh? I, I didn't have to order it online either. There was a local game shop that had it. Thankfully, it was only 60 at the time. What I was going to say, before you rudely interrupted me, uh, I'm 50-50 on whether or not I want a uh, virtual console GameCube, mm. either on the Switch or the Switch's successor or whatever. Because when you have that, the physical copies go down in price, and there's other GameCube games I want to buy, but they're so expensive yeah. right now. And then some of the rare GameCube games that you do have, those are going to go way down in, in price if you ever plan on selling them. Oh, but but I don't. I have, I've I've done it once, and it was just for some extra money, and it was for games I would never play again. But I don't really ever plan on selling some of, like, you know, Melee or Zelda or whatever unless I'm really strapped for cash. But, I mean, that'd be like a last resort kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of want Virtual Console GameCube for the uh, convenience, of course, but also... To help drive down the prices. Oh, yeah. There's, there's some games I want to get. Yeah. I don't think they'll do a virtual console considering the remakes have been doing. I think that's the route they're yeah. taking. Well, they need to hurry up. <laughs> Forget an, a new F Zero game. Give me a remastered oh, F Zero man. GX that game needs, with online that game capability. Needs to be they, they've already shown they can do ninety nine, uh, uh, you know, players. Granted, those games are not yeah, as the, graphical the, heavy. The, yeah, the graphics are just like still, sprites. Yeah, give me a remaster of F Zero GX. That'd be yeah. That'd that be game need, that game needs to be re released. It's it's insane. All right, let's get to a Super Mario. I want to play this again. Lizzie has a. It's her time for the Super Mario, Mario Odyssey copy. review for the Nintendo me. Switch. This is my ninth anniversary <laughs> review. Thank you to everyone who's been there since the beginning and to those who just started watching. Hooray I for really math! <laughs> yep, I knew. <laughs> so, let's get to the review. The beginning puts you right in the middle of Mario and Bowser duking it oh, out. Oh, I Bowser's just realized this peach held captive in this the This scene, After this cutscene takes place in the Mushroom Kingdom uh, level. It, if you go back like a few seconds, you can see Peach's castle and it it's We appreciate your support. So, let's get yeah, to the look. review. The begin yeah. Yeah, th this is like the Mushroom Kingdom, uh -huh. like the secret level. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Spoilers, you right in the I middle guess. Of Mario and Bowser oh, duking it out on Bowser's ship with Peach held captive in the background. After losing the duel and being knocked off the ship, Mario lands in a strange area and meets a Bonitor, uh, more or less a ghost, not like a boo though, in the shape of a top hat named Cappy. For reasons of his own, Cappy decides to join Mario as he searches for Bowser and travels with him in the form of Mario's signature hat. Not long after they meet, they find a disabled ship called the Odyssey, and in order to power it up for use, Mario needs to find power moons scattered throughout each level. Once a minimum number of moons are found, Mario can advance to the next kingdom of the globe. I liked how the amount of moons you needed to fly to the next area was incredibly low. Most kingdoms demand near 10 moons, which is very low considering there was usually 3 to 8 times the amount of total moons in a kingdom. At first I thought this was too forgiving of the game. I thought the player should have to get at least double the minimum in order to move on, but I guess it's a good thing for younger players. Experienced players have the challenge of finding all the moons, but inexperienced players aren't punished if they can't accomplish this and can focus on the main element of the game. Cappy isn't an annoying sidekick like some others. <laughs> By throwing him at specific <laughs> enemies, Mario can I love that. Lack of a that turn that's a very rare instance of animation for me. Yeah. And uh, I thought it was a perfect perfect setting for this. 
accomplish this and can focus on the main element of the game. Cappy isn't an annoying sidekick like some others. By throwing him at specific <laughs> enemies, Mario can, for lack of a better term, possess the enemy. Once Mario has taken over, he gains the abilities of that enemy, like being able to throw hammers as a hammer bro or shoot through the air with limited time as a bullet bill. You can revert back to your normal self at any time. Enemies aren't the only thing Mario can capture. Specific objects are up for grabs as well, like lava bubbles, poles, zippers, and even a manhole cover. I thought this one was the funniest. Look at him go! <laughs> Each kingdom you visit has a different theme, like desert, city, polar, etc. Coins are scattered throughout and they actually behave like currency instead of health and or points. There's the standard familiar gold coins, and there's also kingdom specific purple coins. Spending coins will allow you to obtain different outfits for Mario, as well as knickknacks and stickers for your ship. Hold the on, did, did I do outfits. a subliminal message? I thought that was like a graphical glitch or something. Outfits for Mario, as well as knickknacks. Yeah, specific I purple think that's coins. just. Spending coins will allow you to obtain different outfits. Oh, it... what is that? I guess it was a graphical glitch when you exported the video. Specific purple Here, uh, slow down the video to well, 0.25 yeah. speed. Yeah. Uh, well, we're gonna watch the all the reviews like yeah, this. Yeah. See. Okay. It was. It was. It was something with the uh, the capture card. Yeah. Hey, let's just watch all the reviews in yeah. 0.25 speed from now on. If it if it's at like point two five or point five or point seven five, it'll sound like you're drunk. Yeah. <laughs> for Mario, nice. as well as knickknacks and stickers for your ship. The new outfits are only for cosmetic purposes, but they're still fun to collect. Collecting moons isn't like sunshine and galaxy in the sense that there aren't multiple levels in a single area. Rather, there are multiple moons in one area. Uh, I, this gives it the feeling I'm of open. I'm. Hold, I'm sorry. I'm so surprised I didn't catch that little one frame glitch. Because mm. in the reviewing process, after I finished everything on the timeline, I watch the whole thing. And then when I export it, I watch it again to look for any kind of error. And I missed it completely. Hmm. And Dean Gavin, thank you for the uh, advice. Uh, the arrow, those uh, parentheses. Was it bracket parentheses or whatever the little arrow keys? I didn't know that. Oh, to advance the video by one frame. Yeah, I didn't know that. Oh, uh, open world, but it's still linear in the sense that you're given a specific path of kingdoms to explore, one right after the other. There are a few split paths you can take, but you'll eventually reach every kingdom as you progress. There's so much to do in most kingdoms. Oh, I love that. Figuring out what you can capture is half the fun, it's and so many much of fun. the moons you're trying to collect aren't just hiding around a corner. There's tons of puzzles to solve and areas to explore, and not everywhere is readily accessible. There's a good handful of retro 2D sections, which isn't just for kicks and giggles. Sometimes they'll hold prizes for you to find. There's also a few mini-games, so to speak. I especially enjoyed the Bound Bowl race in the Snow Kingdom. You can check the leaderboard to see where you stack up against other players and your friends... <laughs> Wait. Haha! <laughs> no, this isn't right. <laughs> Aw, oh, man. You beat my score! <laughs> There. Much better. <laughs> Odyssey's visuals so don't disappoint. Some kingdoms really show off the brilliance of detail and color, and no kingdom is aesthetically boring. Controlling Mario is nearly perfect, it's just some of the motion controls can be a bit frustrating when you're trying to pull off a certain action. The depth perception could be a bit low at times, which could make it difficult in capturing enemies, but fortunately you can home in on your targets. There's a camera and filter system you can play with to take some cool looking shots, which is a nice touch. For a the long boss time, were actually uh, a surprise in the sense that there were only a few of them. Uh, 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 the background on my phone was a picture I had made from this game. Oh, cool! It was it was like Mario sleeping next to the sleeping T Rex. Oh yeah. And with the with a bird flying down to Mario, it was like so aesthetically ple pleasing. Oh, it was nice. really good. Nice. I was very proud of myself. <laughs> Which is a nice touch. The boss battles were actually a surprise in the sense that there were only a few of them. Well, let me clarify. There were many times where you'd have to battle one of these annoyances, but they were really just easy, time-wasting mini-bosses at best. When you actually fought a real boss, it was a fun, challenging was experience fun. Yeah. and a satisfying one. I love how he's like, oh no, go away! <laughs> to help you find moons scattered throughout. Even non-traditional looking amiibo can assist you. Ha! <laughs> ha! <laughs> 
good old delicious There's amiibo. There's a co-op mode, which isn't too bad, I must admit. One player controls Mario, and the other can control Cappy and capture enemies. I wish I had saved that box. It's a nice addition, oh, yeah. but if you know me, I'd rather play single player. Super Mario Odyssey is a terrific game that anyone, both experienced and non-experienced, will enjoy. It's quite easy to obtain the minimum amount of moons to advance to the next kingdom, something that will appeal to younger fans, like but also challenging do. enough yeah. with so much to explore and collect in each kingdom, which will please gaming veterans. There's something for everyone in this fantastic Mario adventure. This game gets a 4.75 out of 5 with the title of Epic. Uh, one thing. You... That was a, that was a hint for Skyrim. Yeah, the the song is a EDM remix of the oh, theme. Oh, okay. Uh, one thing about Mario Odyssey you didn't really talk about was um, <clears throat> the uh, uh, the, the like the move set for Mario, how he can um, he can like jump and then throw his hat and then dive on top of his hat to, to like get oh. gain extra bounce and then you can like dive again uh like i i loved uh like moving moving around with mario with with all those like movement options it was super super fun uh i probably didn't i, I probably left that out because i wasn't good at it oh <laughs> and i honestly never really used that mm. uh what, what would you say is your favorite enemy to capture in that game oh the accordion one yeah, that, like, that, that, that one, one is really, really good. Fun. I really like the the bird that you could just like stick stick the beak into the wall and like fling yourself up. Oh yeah, that was that, that one was really fun. I, <laughs> not an enemy, but the the pole in the city that you could. Oh just, yeah, boom. yeah, that that was good too. <clears throat> yeah. um... Vitties, you're not alone in not understanding the hint. Apparently, most people thought I was going to play some kind of EDM game. Or EDM. <laughs> Rhythm game. Yeah, I, I could I could barely hear the the Skyrim theme in that in that remix. Oh, well. That's too bad. There was a fan game titled Super Mario Odyssey long before the official game was even announced. Hmm. And to an extent... The Genesis bootleg Mario 4, a space odyssey. <laughs> Genesis bootleg. Okay. Uh, Darren, I don't know how you say your last name. Logue, maybe? L-O-G-U-E? Anyway, Darren, thank you for coming to the stream. I've played a bit of Skyrim as well as Morrowind and Oblivion. I've only played mm. Skyrim. I have not played the others. We I probably will play uh, Elder... Elder Scrolls 6 when it comes out though. Would you be interested in playing Morrowind or Oblivion? Yeah, probably. Um I I have seen like a couple like in-depth reviews of both games and uh they they definitely don't seem as accessible as Skyrim. They're they're a lot more like archaic mm. in their gameplay, but they're also a lot more uh uh I guess like free free roaming or like very they're very very open ended mm. kind of games. Mm. I remember when Skyrim first came out, I was I was in university at the time. It was like 20, 2011, 2012, somewhere around there. Or no, it was before that. I think. Anyway, um, and so many of my it came out 2011. 2011. So many of my classmates and friends all had it for a computer, and I didn't. I, there's no way my old laptop could handle Skyrim. Mm. But I just remember hearing about it. I was like, oh, that sounds really fun. But I just never got to it until it came out on Switch of all consoles. I had never heard of Elder Scroll Scrolls before Skyrim came yeah, out. Yeah, me neither. I've never heard of that name. Just, yeah. It was Skyrim. The, and then, the series. And yeah. then when I went, when I saw it came to Switch, I was like, wait, it. Oh, Elder Scrolls is like. The universe. The, the series. Is the thing, series. Yeah. I was like, oh, I thought they were two separate things. Hmm. Well, we should get into the review. We're we're kind of slow, I think. I'm just reading the comments. Hmm. Okay, here we go. Caution. 
discretion. This is an M-rated game, so the magical chicken insists that viewer discretion is advised. It's time this for the song is like way too bombastic Skyrim for this like for the Nintendo Switch. Don't you think? It, it builds I remember up. when Skyrim was all the rage like back the when it was first released mm -hmm. in 2011. Six years later, I'm playing it for the first time, and I can see why this game was so popular. So, let's get I guess into like, the details. Uh, Elden Ring. I've never played any aspect, prior right? Elder Scrolls mm -hmm. game before, so I have no background about the lore, the land, the stories, and whatnot. This is my the beginning of the game allows too, you to choose your race and physical traits. It's cool how each race has their own unique passive and active skills and talents. Buster. This is a massive open world RPG. There is so much to do and explore, but the main storyline of the game is that early on you become aware that you are the next Dragonborn, a powerful being with the ability to capture dragon souls and use them to unlock secret powers. There's much more to this tale, but I won't spoil it for those of you like me who didn't play this on day one. Your character has a number of skill set trees. Every time you level up, you can choose to increase your health, stamina, or magicka, and you can learn or increase a specific ability amongst many different factions. Leveling up is different in this game as opposed to other RPGs in the sense that you don't gain experience points for kills or turning in quests. Instead, using specific weapons, casting spells, crafting items, picking locks, and sneaking around is the basis of leveling up. There's many more trees of how to level up, but I'm not going to list them all off. If you use a two-handed weapon often, your experience within that specific skill set will level up, which, in turn, increases your experience for your overall main level. I thought this was a fantastic way to level up. Instead of grinding your way up by killing a seemingly unending plethora of enemies, or turning in monotonous quests, using specific skills will do just the trick. This keeps the game fresh and interesting, because it's always fun to upgrade specific skill sets and obtain different combinations. Not sure if it's possible, but it seems plausible that you could reach level 100 just by picking locks and crafting weapons. But where's the fun in that? Fighting enemies is the real entertainment, but it can also be a daunting task. Some enemies will really test your skills, and it can be easy to die. This is why you need to save your game frequently. There is an autosave feature, but it doesn't autosave enough, and sometimes you'll be at the very end of a quest and, oops, you died, and now you have to start at the beginning. This happened to me more times than I'd like to admit, so take it from me and save your game. However, do not save your game right before you die, because guess what? As soon as you load it back up, you're dead. When you performed a death blow or a kill shot, the camera angle would change and time would slow down for a cool little cinematic, a nice touch to show off your superior battle skills. The graphics look great for a game that was made, at the time of this video, seven years ago for last-gen consoles. Now I don't know if it's because it's the Switch version, but there are many graphical pop-ins everywhere. I thought it was interesting how detailed you could get with your character's physical features, seeing how you'll hardly ever see his or her face again. Even when I was able to, I usually had this mask on anyway, so... yeah. Now, there are quite a few glitches that I found. They didn't hinder my progress, but it does remove the level of immersiveness the game tries to earn. Is that the same song? No. I also thought the one. physics oh, okay. were a bit off. Like when riding a horse up a mountainside. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Or like this right here. I believe <laughs> I can fly. The controls I love are how it's hard. perfect. His Most hand is on his uh -huh. selecting <laughs> items and spells from your quick select menu, which is a very welcome feature. The motion like controls are fun to use, uh -huh. but most of the time I preferred the pro controller. The map is fairly hey, huge, mouse, even back. by today's standards. It's nice that you can fast travel to a location, however you won't be able to if you're burned down by too many things to carry. Pac-Man cheese. I thought it was hilarious how you could eat food from your pack, which would lighten your carrying load, yes, but it technically wouldn't make your yeah. whole self lighter. Uh -huh. but Unless whatever. he poops as it out immediately. Where I need to go. Here's a trick though, if you're carrying too much to run, you can perform power attacks to move in little bursts. There are tons of quests and things to do. I thought it was cool how you could even start a family by buying a house and adopting a child. I like the attention to detail in the NPC's character traits and personalities. You can hire mercenaries or have companions with you to help uh, fight by your on, side, hold on, hold on, and what's on. even better- Hold on. I don't- you've never played the game, right? Nope. Yeah, so- House and adopting a child. I like the attention okay. to- Okay, his name? Ulfir? Yeah. Ul or Ulfir? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The Blind. Detail in the NPCs and his book, and his book. And his book. Oh, <laughs> it's <laughs> mercenaries or have companions with you to help fight by your side. And what's even better, they usually weren't completely useless. They would actually deal severe damage and get many kills for you. The downside is you have to make sure they don't die because they will not come back. 
This was another interesting feature. If a certain NPC dies, the game will inform you with a letter from a postal carrier. It's rather sad, too. I didn't like how battle buddies wouldn't follow you to certain places, and their IQ level seemed a bit low when it came to avoiding traps. <laughs> the voice acting was from fantastic, that? however yeah. I noticed the audio mixing wasn't exactly correct in some areas, like these. <laughs> oh well, must have run off. Well, this you version of Skyrim it. has all the I DLC mean, from the yes. original. <laughs> Dragonborn, Hearthfire, and Dawnguard are all here, which is awesome. This game supports amiibo play. If you're lucky, you can find a certain hero's items, which is quite fun. However, they aren't actually that great as far as ratings go. Still, gotta Are they love good crossovers. like in the beginning of the game? One thing I wish Skyrim nah. had was multiplayer. Mm. I think it would have been awesome to quest with a friend. It would have made the game even better. But overall, Skyrim on Switch is a great experience. With all the DLC, motion controls, and amiibo support added, if you've never played Skyrim before, the Switch edition is a great choice. This game gets a 4.5 out of 5 with the title of Epic. <laughs> To. It was it was too long, and uh, the reveal of magical chicken was, uh, I don't know, it, everything was just too long. But I could not find um, a sound effect like that that worked. That, oh, rising was, strings. Yeah, <clears throat> and that was the best one I could find. I was like, oh, whatever, I'll just go with that. Hmm. Cat Fox, thanks for coming to the stream. Oh yeah, fun fact: Charles Martinet actually voices Dragon in this game. Huh. Yeah, in Skyrim. Hmm. I think his name is Parthernax, I want to say. Hmm. Yep, we are to a Dragon Ball game. Rest in peace, Akira mm. Toriyama. Rest in peace. I I grew up watching Dragon Ball Z on Toonami when mm. I was a kid. It was so awesome. And then I watched... Uh, I watched the entirety of Dragon Ball um, about 12 years ago. And Dragon Ball is better story-wise. Um, and Dragon Ball Z is definitely better battle-wise. Yeah, Dragon Ball Z was... I'm, I'm pretty sure it was the first anime I ever I ever saw. It, yeah, he, he was a legend, for sure. Yeah. Walkup says you are correct in... Uh, the voicing of the dragon. Oh, okay. Alright, here we go. It's time for the Dragon Ball Revenge of King Piccolo review. For the Wii. I've always had a mild interest in this game since it was released, just because it's Dragon Ball. But now that the Magical Chicken has commanded a review, let's see how it turned out. This is a platforming beat-em-up. If you've ever seen Dragon Ball before, you can take a pretty good guess as to what this game is about. For those of you who don't know, Dragon Ball focuses on Goku's adventures when he was a child. The first level starts you out near a Red Ribbon Army base while Goku searches for the 4-star Dragon Ball. After a few levels, you'll quickly notice that this game's core demographic is for kids. This isn't a bad thing, but if you're not in that group, you may find this game too easy and possibly boring. Most enemies you fight aren't difficult, especially when you can just mash the attack button for easy kills. Speaking of which, the default button mapping has the A button for attacking and B for jumping. This is so opposite of what I'm used to, and if you're like me, you'll want to switch it before you begin the game. As I was saying, winning battles isn't a challenge. You can spam B in almost any situation and come out on top. 
There are a few different combos you can pull off by pushing up or down on the analog stick, but even this is a challenge when you first play. Because you're in a 3D environment, pushing up or down on the nunchuck will of course move you up or down on the Z axis. But when you're battling enemies and want to perform a combo other than the standard B spam, your first instinct is to immediately push up or down to perform these combos, but by doing so you'll turn in a different direction and start punching the air. What you have to do is begin a standard combo, then push up or down when you're in the second or third hit. An up combo will launch enemies back and stun them, and a down combo will launch the enemy in the air. You'd think they'd be reversed. You can follow up with these two combos for finishing blows by pressing Z at the right time. Following up with these moves only work on minor enemies in certain boss fights, which sucks because now you have to grind out a win with basic attacks. As you connect hits, your key gauge under your health will fill up. If you have at least one section full, you can launch Kamehameha waves which will hit any enemy in its path. It's nice that you can also follow up a standard combo with a Kamehameha. But even with these abilities, the gameplay is shallow because of the lack of attack combos, lack of AI intelligence, no throwing abilities, and you can't roll while guarding. This feature alone would have made the game more fun because even though enemies aren't difficult to defeat, if you get ganged up on, it can be tough to not get hit. Guarding won't save you from enemy power attacks, and your shield will break if it quickly gets hit too many times, so you'll try to escape, but in doing so, you'll get hit. Fortunately, if you die, the game is extremely forgiving and will start you back up with full health in the exact spot you died in. Oh. And to make it even more generous, the number of continues you use in a level doesn't seem to make much of an impact, if any, on your final grade at the end of a level. There are 9 areas, each with at least one level. The game will take you roughly 6 hours to complete, which isn't that long at all. Some of the levels near the end of the game aren't levels, but just boss fights. The last level in an area has a boss fight, which can actually be a challenge. Once you beat a level, you'll be graded on how well you did, and your final grade will determine how much zenny you earned. You can spend zenny at a shop to unlock character models, cutscenes, music, and voice clips. But who cares about all that? You'll want to spend your zenny on health upgrades for Goku first and foremost. I didn't like that health upgrades was the only thing you could buy that would help you in-game. No attack combos, techniques, or anything. This would have really helped stave off the monotonous repetition of each level. I also didn't like that a few levels weren't actually playable. All it was is a cutscene to drive the story along. Well, if it's just a cutscene, why is it portrayed as a playable level then? The cutscene should just immediately start at the end of the last level, not trick us into thinking it's another playable level. Hmm. Throughout many levels, you'll find treasures to collect, which you can view later on. It was nice that the game lets you know how many you had left to find, if you cared enough to find them. The graphics and animations look great. They fit well for the Dragon Ball universe. Only thing I didn't like was the mouth movements for the characters within cutscenes weren't synced well at all. It's fine if the mouth movements are just flaps like an anime, but at least take the time to sync them up. The voice acting was spot on though, as expected. There's a two player tournament mode which is mediocre at best. The biggest problems are that of the main game. Not enough variety of attacks, no throwing moves, and no rolling while guarding. There is a special guard breaking attack, but playing this just makes you wish you were playing a better Dragon Ball game like Tenkaichi 3. Dragon Ball Revenge of King Piccolo is a game only for young Dragon Ball fans. Honestly, it should have been called Dragon Ball Goku's Adventures Super Abridged Version, because within the 6 hours of gameplay, you play through key areas only. Between each level, you're given a narration of everything you don't get to play. If the gameplay was given a heavy polish and more levels were available, this could have been a great addition to the Dragon Ball game library. Instead, it's a washed down beat em up for kids that more experienced players won't find that appealing. It's not a bad game, but I'd much rather play other Dragon Ball games than this. This game gets a 3 out of 5 with the title of Passable. I don't even know what that is. It's extremely cryptic. It is the Smash Bros. for Wii U roster. Oh. And the only one circled is Shulk. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, it's kind of weird. Um, I'm guessing that, that Dragon Ball game was rated e t E10, right? Uh, do I still have it? No, I don't. Well, if it is, like... Isn't it weird how, like, games that uh, have, like... They, they try to target a, uh, a young demographic in terms of, like, the difficulty. They they have the rating be E10. You know? Yeah. Like, it's it's like that uh, Princess Peach game. I, I've heard that game is, like, super easy, but it's rated E10. Like, uh, like 10-year-olds, they... 
10 year olds are they can be pretty competent at games i don't right the rating doesn't have anything to do with the difficulty e they're kind of correlated though but but but, but they're not they're not though well, I mean, like, yeah, the the parent has to has to buy the game for the little kid, but but a, a, an e like an e ten kind of implies that a you know this game is gonna be a, a appropriate for ten year olds or up. Mm -hmm. So the the di shouldn't the difficulty be kind of synonymous yeah like correlated with with uh, the rating it it usually is but the whole argument that the rating is showing the difficulty is it, it's not though it can't be like um uh sam and max that's a t-rated game it's not hard at all yeah I mean, in terms of gameplay like figuring out puzzles that could be a little difficult but it's tea for the uh, crude humor. Yeah. Anyway, I I agree to an extent. Okay. So, born in a world of strife, against the odds, we choose to fight, blossom dance. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Oh man, I want to play it again. <laughs> I have it for Switch, and I've thought about doing a review for it, but there's not much uh, except for the except for like the the side story the side story of course the graphics are d better but other than that That's i feel like it. there's not much to go on for a review it would be more of like a maybe i could turn that into a youtube short like well, here's actually, the difference w would you uh review the the extra story as its own thing uh po possibly i've never thought about that hmm. here we go Oh, I love this song. The, the music in this game is so good. It's, so good. it's I just time for the, the Xenoblade Chronicles like review mm. for the Wii. I remember seeing the petition to bring this game to North America. I didn't sign it because I had very little interest in it at the time, but now that I've played it, it's become one of those games where I wish I hadn't waited so long to play, so let's find out why. This is a massive JRPG, and one of the first, if not the first, of its kind I've ever played. The story is set in a world where two titans, the Bionis and the Makanis, are the existence holders for other beings which use their bodies as their home. One of the beings on the Bionis are Homs, who are in a seemingly never-ending war with the inhabitants of the Makanis, the Mekon. The main story focuses around a Homs named Shulk. As you play through, you'll meet up with other characters to join your party. There are two modes of playing, exploring slash interacting, and fighting. When exploring, you have the freedom of going virtually anywhere within the map, picking up items scattered throughout, and just traveling in general. It's not open world, but it may feel like it from time to time because of just how large each area is. Fighting can be complex, yet rewarding. When you first engage in battle, your character will always face the targeted enemy and a list of commands will show up on screen. I'll admit, when I first began playing, I was a bit confused on how the fighting mechanics worked. Once in battle, my first impression was that I had to perform every action, including auto attacks. Yet, as the name suggests, these attacks happen automatically without a need for user input. Your main job is to strategize with the different attacks and abilities, known as arts, your specific character has, along with the arts of the other characters. For example, with Shulk, one of his arts is Slit Edge. If you use it on one of the sides of the enemy, this art, when connected, will not only deal damage, but also lower the physical defense of the enemy. Another art is Backslash, where if performed behind the enemy, will yield higher damage than if you used it in front or on the sides of the enemy. You'll have to wait for a cooldown period in order to use the same art again. I greatly enjoy these elements because it forces strategic planning on your part in more way than one. What I mean is, you will have to have another character draw aggro towards them in order for you to perform these arts with their max effectiveness. Aggro is basically the level of animosity an enemy has towards a character. If the character you're maining has high aggro, it could hinder your ability to perform your specific arts with their max potential. As in the- I want to say, just a little side note, first time playing this, when uh, Dunban joined your party, mm -hmm. I thought I was nearing the end of the game. Really? Yeah. Oh wow. <laughs> that's that's only like the a first, third. The first third, third, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know why I thought that, but I guess it was because just a little spoiler. He gets hurt in the beginning, and uh, he's like finally back for like the final push. Oh, okay. But thank thank God it wasn't. That'd be a super short game. 
the case with Shulk, if you're playing as him and you've drawn too much aggro, the enemy will face you until another character draws higher aggro, in which during that time your arts that require you to strike the enemy from an angle other than the front won't be able to be as effective until then. When battling, you'll be given quick time event chances to perform. Once triggered, the game will pause for just a second, and a ring with the B button will appear in the center. Quick time events happen when a character performs a move and another character notices, whether good or bad. If a character connects a hit well, the quick time event will trigger, and if successful, another character will comment on how well they did. The same goes for a character missing an attack. Don't worry about it. Performing successful quick time events yields multiple rewards. The party gauge near the top left of the screen will fill up some, the affinity between the two characters will increase, and the tension of a character has a chance to rise. The party gauge is your best non-character friend. If the gauge is at least one-third full, you'll be able to revive a fallen party member. If it's completely full, you'll be able to perform a chain attack where all three characters can perform successive moves to bring down enemies. This is a great ability that can turn the tide of battle in your favor. Certain arts from one character can complement another, leading to some great combinations. Winning battles will gain you XP towards your level in arts and affinity between your characters. Enemies will drop loot in the form of items to collect, combat gear, crystals, and gems. Gems are especially important because of the additional boost to stats they can give your characters. I suggest you don't follow my lead and not change up the main party member until after you've acquired more characters as you play through. I like to main Shulk for the most part, but maining other characters definitely has its benefits. As in the case of Sharla, she's basically, well not basically, she is the healer of the group, and I like to main her when in a boss battle. This is where I need to talk about the AI. Because you only control one character at a time, the AI controlling your other two party members will perform decently for the most part. There are times though that it just doesn't do well enough when the situation calls for, so I find it best to switch up the party layout often, especially deep into the game. Like I said, I usually main Charla when fighting tougher enemies and bosses, yet I like to main glass cannons such as Shulk and Melia for the majority of the game. I will say the AI does pretty good controlling tank characters, such as Ryan. I hardly ever mained Ryan because it was more crucial that I main characters with more strategic arts. Not to say Ryan... Um... My first playthrough is mainly Shulk, and I, I would switch it up here and there, but then on my second playthrough, I found out uh, Melia is can just do insane damage mm. like all the other characters can in certain situations but on a consistent basis Melia um with her lightning uh elemental base it, insane mm. damage i i never really got uh or I, I never really figured out how to how to do well with her i oh. i she was definitely the the most difficult party member to to like really utilized for me oh oh if you i'm telling you if you can it's so worth it you can take down um enemies like mm. that um, I, I think i i think my favorite characters to play as were probably shulk and dunban i want to say dunban is really fun yeah uh also i want to say the tension mechanic it took me a while to fully understand what it was oh that that's with their their portraits right where they're screaming <laughs> yeah. or when they're yeah, right now Shulk is like, ah, and yeah, yeah. are kind of neutral. Yeah. So they're not going to do as much damage. But uh, it took me a while, and I had to reread the manual to really understand what that was about. Mm -hmm. Ryan and other tanks don't have strategic abilities that need to be used in certain situations, and this is where one of my favorite game mechanics comes into play. So Shulk wields a weapon called the Monado. It's a mysterious, powerful blade which holds great abilities. Because Shulk wields it, he's able to see future events, and this becomes extremely important when fighting enemies. When engaged in battle, if you or another character is about to be knocked out from an attack, the battle will pause, the screen will flash, and you'll be given a vision of the future attack. Once seen, the battle will resume, and a countdown gauge at the top of the screen will begin. The gauge gives you information of the enemy about to perform the attack, the type of attack, the future victim, and how long you have until the vision becomes reality. During this time, you're able to change the future, but only if you perform actions which disrupt it. For example, if you or one of your teammates is about to be knocked out from a physical attack, you could perform one of the Monado's special abilities called Shield, which will surround everyone in their own impenetrable barrier, so long as the level of the ability is high enough to withstand the attack. If so, the gauge at the top will break and the vision will not become reality. Another example is to warn one of your teammates about the vision, however you must have at least one third of your party gauge filled in order to do so. 
If you warn a teammate, you're able to use one of their abilities to hopefully change the future. Choose wisely, as you only get one chance. There are many scenarios in which you can cancel the future knockout, which is greatly appreciated. This is one of the best looking Wii games out there. I was shocked at how well everything looks. Although it's 480p, some areas seem to border HD resolution just because the artwork is so beautiful. My favorite areas were Satoru Marsh at night, and Aerith Sea mm. both day and night. The controls were basically perfect. I hear most people play with the Classic Controller Pro, but I had no issues with the Wiimote Nunchuck combo. Only thing I wish was that if you were using the combo, it incorporated some usage of the motion controls, like swinging the Wiimote to perform a quick time event, but it's not that big of a deal. The camera followed you well for the most part, but sometimes it could give you unfavorable angles. Fortunately, you had virtually full control of the camera. This game has one of the best music soundtracks ever in a video game. Again, some of my favorites are Satoru Marsh at night, and Aerith C both day and night. There weren't any songs I didn't like. Most of the boss fights were pretty difficult, I must admit. Now that's normally not a bad thing, but the problem I had with it was that it seemed as though some of them were just too high a level when you reached them. I know they're supposed to be strong, of course, but some of them just seemed too strong when you first encounter them and wasn't justified by the amount of regular enemies you had to fight to get to them. In these cases, you had to go back and grind your level up, which wasn't that fun. Being three or more levels lower than the boss, or any enemy in general, can be very disadvantageous to you, as your characters will miss attacks more often, their tension will be difficult to rise, and many times you'll feel like you're fighting a losing battle. It's best to stray from the main path and go fight extra enemies before getting to a boss, but I didn't like that this felt forced on you in order to beat a boss. The story is engaging, the voice acting is amazing, the graphics, music, and characters just pull you in and don't let you go. There's tons to do and rarely does it feel monotonous or boring. I'm so glad this game came overseas. It's a true gem to the Wii's library. This game gets a 4.75 out of 5 with the title of... Yeah. Cool. Alright! <laughs> Thanks, Randy. Too red. I'm gonna tell mom now. Yeah, you're dead. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to remember what game this is. <laughs> um. Oh wait. H have you done Mario Kart Eight yet? Yeah. Oh yeah, you have. So it's not that. Uh. I'm in first place now, but now you. S oh, is it? Oh, it's um, Super Mario Party, right? Yes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, I also want to say, during this time, whenever this came out, I was kind of in a uh, poem phase. Oh, I don't really? Under I don't know how it happened, but coming up with this was not difficult at all. Hmm. And uh, uh, for those of you out there, um, <clears throat> I don't know, about somewhere between five and ten years ago, uh, I bought my dad... Uh, tickets to a Seahawk game, and uh, Red Knight. Oh, Red I Knight remember were gonna this. Go. Yeah. And we made this this uh, video. I'm not gonna go into it, but we made this video showing the tickets. Um, it was kind of like a birthday surprise. And in the video, I made this this poem of basically saying what we're going to do and which is go to the game but it was kind of in a an old english style that uh you had to really think about to tell what what i was saying but that plus this it was it was really easy for me to come up mm. with the poem so i thought i don't i don't know i don't know if i can do it anymore but i thought it was pretty cool didn't like that that thing you wrote for dad didn't it take him like a while to realize what what the what it was yeah <laughs> Um, Nick Ray says, Frequency, you should play the sequels. Xenoblade 3 especially with Future Redeemed included. It is in my top 10 games of all time and 3 is my favorite Switch exclusive. Mm. I do. Um, somebody said... Oh, up at the top. D 
Dean. Did I did you frequency? Did you not do many quests on your first playthrough? I was thinking about that as the review was going. You, you never uh, uh, filled out um, Colony Six very much. No, on I your didn't. first playthrough. No, no, no. Okay, so I was thinking about that, and I realized what I had said in the terms that some of the boss fights were, or enemies in general, were a much higher level and wasn't justified. Well, it's because I didn't really do a lot of quests. Yeah, it, it, it expects you it, to do some quests. It's yeah. because I was trying to get the review out quickly, and I didn't want to do any kind of side kind of thing. But on my second playthrough, I did all of that, and I was a way higher level than some of the other areas that I had mentioned before. Mm -hmm. I think I did rebuild Colony 6 all the way. That was That was pretty fun. I think I did too, or at least like I was one level away from it being com fully complete. Hmm. Um, even even in Colony Nine, uh, there's so much to do before you actually progress to the main campaign. Yeah, it, it's crazy. That whole first chapter pretty much only takes place in Colony Nine. Yeah. All right, Super... Oh, wait, sorry. Super Mario Party! It's time for the Super Mario Party review for the Nintendo Switch. It's been a while since I last played a Mario Party game. Actually, Mario Party 8 was the most recent before this game, which, at the time of this review, was just over nine years ago. The beginning cutscene shows Mario and Pals arguing on who is the superstar, or basically, who's the number one? Bowser and his minions show up and argue it, it, that's it could kind be of one a weird of them thing to like. <laughs> I know. What, what do you mean by like superstar? They all agreed like, to a board. What does that even mean? I know. Well, you know, Mario Party. <laughs> there are a handful of game modes to play, and after you complete the entirety of each mode, you'll earn a gem with the main goal of obtaining all five. The traditional mode, simply named Mario Party, offers four unique boards, each with their own twists and surprises. Right off the bat, it felt lackluster, not only in the amount of boards to choose from, but the size of each board. They all beg to be at least 25% larger than what they were. However, perhaps the size of each board isn't the main attraction, as this Mario Party features a few strategic gimmicks. Throughout each map, there are special spaces where if you land on one, you'll be given an ally in the form of a CPU character. You can have multiple allies at once, and they can help in certain situations. One of their main abilities is to roll an extra 1-2 to two value die, adding a small boost to your own die. Speaking of dice, each character has their own unique die. You of course have the option to roll Thank the traditional 1-6 die, but you can also die roll your dice. character's yeah. die to try to strategize that, it with. It really Mario bugs me when people say dice for While singular. other characters like Bowser have high risk reward dice with coin losses and high numbers like 9 and 10. If you have an ally by your side, you can choose to roll their dice block for additional options. Even though different multiple dice can add to the strategy, the value of the dice that you land on is still random, as it should be. We all figured out pretty quickly that you have a much higher chance at winning the game if you have allies. It was nice that you could even acquire allies via a certain item, and not have to only rely on landing directly on an ally spot. Mario Party wouldn't be Mario Party without minigames, and this bunch has some pretty fun ones, as well as some duds. Many use the motion controls of the Joy-Con, which I have to say most were pretty spot on as far as tracking your movements. It was nice that not all minigames used motion control, and instead relied on the face buttons and analog stick. Some of the 1v3 minigames were borderline unfair for the single player, and vice versa for the three players. One thing I wish was different was the amount of bonus stars after a match. There are many different bonus stars available, but only two are presented after every match, and it's always random of which two stars are going to be up for grabs. I thought there should be at least three bonus stars, and perhaps more if you played a match with a high number of turns. Mario Party mode is the classic way to play, however there's another mode similar, yet different, called Partner Party. In this mode, you and another player will team up against two others while trying to collect stars. The two of you will roll separate dice and add them for a total number of spaces each of you can move. You're able to move in any direction, however you have to land directly on the star space to collect them, unlike the classic mode where all you need to do is at least pass the space. There aren't any coins or ally spaces, rather you can pick up floating coins around the board, as well as move to a space where a random ally is located to have them join your team. I like this mode quite a bit because of the higher focus of strategy and TEAMWORK you have to utilize in order to win. One game mode called Soundstage takes on a WarriorWare likeness in a series of rhythm minigames. Oh, I this like that This one's pretty one, yeah. fun, especially with three other players. It's nice that a match only takes about five minutes, so it's good for when you want to play something quickly. There's a team mode called River Survival where you raft down a multi-branch oh, yeah, river. One. 
You have to complete co-op minigames to acquire more time for you to paddle downstream. While the core element of the game is the same for each branch and path, it does have replayability because each branch has different sub-elements like avoiding cheap cheeps or maneuvering through rocks. There's a gauntlet mode, so to speak, called Challenge Road where you have to complete a long stretch of minigames in one go. Well, actually, it's not one go, since you can take a break and come back to it later. Yeah, it's the over. I was just thinking that, and then I saw it. It's fun, but can get yeah. tedious as you go on. There's a super shallow online mode called Online Mario-thon, where you get to play a group of minigames with either your friends or other players around the world to see who can get the highest score. I say shallow because the, I was really hoping for an actual traditional match with Mario Party Online, really good regardless for, uh -huh, of who for no reason. Even if it's restricted <laughs> to just playing with friends, it would have been a much better experience than what we got. Hopefully an update can add this. Every time a game mode is completed, you'll earn party points, which is a currency you can use to buy collectibles and cosmetics in the form of stickers, which you can use to decorate with. I didn't really care about the points, but they're there for people who enjoy collecting the prizes. Super Mario Party is a nice addition to the franchise, but it's hard to look the other way when it comes to some of its flaws. Its biggest problem is the number of boards it has in Mario Party mode. Like, really? Four boards? That's it? It needs to have a minimum of six, but preferably eight. The boards themselves need to be at least 25% larger than they currently are, and regular online matches needs to be a thing. Fix these three shortcomings, and you have yourself one Super Mario Party. This game gets a 3.75 out of 5, with the title of Good. Oh yeah, here's another poem. Oh yeah, see? So, so here we are once again, more focused than ever before. As controller's grip yields tighten vein, uh, yields tighten vein. Oh, oh, I see. So do your eyes meet with fiery core? Has strong with drive. Will uh, we begin the trial? Beckoning will with mock as I return. Revenge now fills my soul's vial. Oh, victory now! How I yearn. So now, red, your time has come. <laughs> uh, now I'm trying to figure out what this is. Uh, controller's. Oh wait, is it uh, is it Smash Ultimate? Yep. Oh uh, yeah. Sure is. The music's so epic. Yep. Um. Somebody said. Oh, I don't remember who said it. Oh, I think it was Darren said we need uh, Super Mario Party 2 with GameCube boards. Mm. I, I would just like some DLC for Mario Party Superstars. Yeah, that'd be good. That, I'm surprised it never got any. I don't know why. Uh, maybe the game's just not as popular as I think, but I, I love Mario Party. I don't get to play it as much mm. as I want to, though. What was it? Oh, oh, never mind. Never mind. We are not getting DLC. That that really sucks. Bolt Mouse says he owns the Japanese versions of Mario Party two, four, and six. Hmm. That's interesting. I you, you don't own any of the ja any Japanese versions of games, do you? No. No, neither do I. They uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but they wouldn't play no. on my American Switch. No, I brain. think I think the Switch is the first Nintendo console that's uh, region locked? it's not region locked. Oh, not region locked. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. I, I guess uh, Viddy says, do the Mario Party games sell well? I, I guess not. Apparently not enough to give DLC, which is a huge bummer. Hmm. Oh, I, I guess... The closest I have to a Japanese game would be, um, I've I've downloaded the uh, uh, NES Switch uh, NES Switch Online in Japanese, uh, so I I've, I've played some of the Japanese games uh, from that. Like I I remember playing Metroid. Metroid is actually better in Japanese because the music just sounds way better. Oh yeah, the music's different. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, it's because the Famicom had more sound channels than the oh, NES. Oh, okay. Why didn't they just make a an English version of the Famicom? Why did they make a separate system? That doesn't um, make sense. I, oh, I think I I think I remember um, they they wanted to make the NES 
more uh, like they, they didn't want to sell it as like a video game because uh because you know the, the crash uh, the video game mm-hmm. crash uh it soured the the public's mind uh on video games so nintendo tr- nintendo america tried to sell the nes as more like a toy huh so you know that they, they had rob and like the nes oh, zapper that's right. oh, okay yeah and so they they probably uh made the nes a like a little bit less um powerful at least mm-hmm. with the sound just cost to effective. just to yeah bring down costs okay um nick ray frequency what was the music for smash ultimate hint i can't remember the name of the song but it's it's from the artist two steps from hell they, oh yeah that one really epic movie like yeah it's really good Oh, oh, that's right. Yeah, I think the Famicom disc system. I think that that added the the sound channels. Oh, okay. And the disc system never made it over to uh, to America or the West. <clears throat> All right, let's get into the next review. This review is way shorter than uh, oh, Smash yeah. Bros on Wii U. Wow. And like I said last time, Smash Bros for Wii U footage. I was watching it and I was like, oh my gosh, I suck. <laughs> but this one, I feel like I'm better. Not Definitely not high tier, but definitely better. Mm. I'll be the judge of that. Oh, you can't watch it. <laughs> it's time for the Super Smash Brothers Ultimate Review for the Nintendo Switch. I'll admit, when I first saw the teaser trailer, I thought this was going to be a port of Smash Wii U with maybe a few new additions, similar to Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, so I wasn't too excited initially. However, when I finally woke up and realized the truth, I was pumped! I was just hoping they wouldn't call it Smash Bros. Switch, (laughs) but they wised up and gave it an ultimate name. And with such a boastful title, you'd expect it to provide the greatest Smash experience, right? Of course! Well, let's see if it delivers. If anyone watching is unfamiliar with the Smash series, it's a fighter with the core goal of knocking your opponent off the stage. In previous Smash sequels, there's more characters to choose from right off the bat, with unlockable characters obtainable down the road. However, in Ultimate, you start off with the 8 base characters from the N64 title and fight your way through battles hmm. to unlock the massive roster awaiting you. Once you and acquire all the, the fighters, DLC. your roster will display them in the order they were originally added in the series. Some DLC. Although a neat idea, I prefer it if they were no, organized there by are game, no DLC but it's here. not a big deal. Really? It's great, yeah, however, that every single character from previous Smash titles are in this one. I especially enjoy having Simon Belmont as a character, as he was my vote in the Smash Ballad. The only character left that I wish they would add is Skull Kid. Of course, I know he's an assist, so it's something, but still, Skull Kid would complete my character wish list. I guess he would <laughs> too, but... <laughs> eh. <laughs> More serious players enjoy one-on-one battles with no frills, but if you just want a silly, chaotic match, there are plenty of variables to do just that. New and familiar items can turn the tide of battle, and many stage hazards can disrupt the flow. Another option includes customizing character traits. Point is, whatever your playstyle, Ultimate has you covered. This game changes things up in terms of rule setting and character stage selection in the way that you first determine the rules and stage before selecting your character. I appreciate that you can save a set of rules for future battles instead of having to change them each time you turn on the game. However, I wish that it would remember your previous character selection every time you want to play a consecutive match. It may sound like a minor complaint, but it does get annoying when you play many matches in a row. Some new and returning modes include Tourney, where up to 32 players, human or CPU, can battle it out in a bracket to see who's top dog, Smashdown, where a number of matches is first determined, and after every match, the characters that were used will become unavailable in the preceding fights, and Squad Strike, where players choose their team of characters, and once a fighter is knocked out during a match, the next chosen character will come in and fight. I have to say, I had this exact idea for a game mode when Smash Wii U came out, so I really enjoyed that this was added. Another feature that I honestly thought of back when Brawl was out was Stage Morph. When activated, the current stage will morph into a different one without pause of the fight. It is so cool they added this. Classic mode returns once again, however unlike Smash Wii U, it's gone back to its roots and plays similarly to the N64 Classic mode. I appreciate it returning to this style, however I didn't like that the bonus game was the same thing for all characters, yeah, and there's no like target smash. Game. It was cool, however, that themed fighters, including the boss, will battle you depending on who you play as, such as Zelda characters when playing as Young Link. The adventure mode in Ultimate is quite, well, an adventure. 
Titled World of Light, this mode has you begin playing as Kirby, I wonder why, and the goal is to tour a large map, unlocking characters to join you as you get ready to... I, I feel like in some of the comments for this one, when I said, I wonder why, Kirby, like, I'm being sarcastic, I, of course I know why, but there are a lot of comments and it's because Kirby they, was uh, Sakurai's... They couldn't favorite. tell that you were sarcastic? No! I was like, really? Your, your tone was obviously sarcastic. I, I know. The battle gleam, a mysterious oh, it's yet because powerful you didn't light put beam. Slash in order to S retrieve the characters, the, uh, though, at the you must battle oh, against puppet so, yeah. These warriors hold a specific spirit within them, and once you defeat the puppet fighter, the spirit will be freed and added to your uh, inventory, so to speak. Spirits have special attributes that can help again. you in situational battles. Yeah, you I can only level up your primary the spirits to be more effective in terms of attack and defensive power, and many primary spirits allow you to attach support spirits, which give your character a unique advantage, such as starting out giant, or beginning a match with a specific item, or even healing abilities. There are tons of spirits to collect, and mix and matching them up to your characters for specific battles nice. is a lot of fun. I'm not sure which adventure mode I like better, this or Subspace Emissary. Both have similarities, yet differences to make them stand out from each other. I don't think it's fair to say one is better than the other, because both are good for what they're trying to be. I enjoyed the 2D side-scrolling brawler that Subspace was, yet I enjoy the conciseness and ever-changing variables of battles in World of Light. Unlike previous installments, Ultimate does not have an event mode. However, World of Light could be argued as just that, and I'd say this is correct. They combined adventure and event modes into one long, yet fun, experience. It took me roughly 36 hours to 100% complete it on hard difficulty, and believe me, it will test your skills. There's a mode called Spirit Board where you can obtain various spirits by completing certain tasks. The types of spirits adjust frequently due to Nintendo changing that, up the event themes. That line was yeah. a throwback to Brawl, the first yeah. video. I like this. I feel like you say that a lot in your reviews. The types of spirits adjust frequently just that board where you can obtain various... Um, it's usually on purpose. Mm. ...spirits by completing certain tasks. The types of spirits adjust frequently due to Nintendo changing up the event themes. I like this because it decreases the chance of the spirit board becoming stale and keeps things fresh and interesting. Three different sub-modes under the umbrella of a mode called Mob Smash have unique challenges. One of them is All-Star, and I found this version to be less enjoyable than previous installments. Instead of battling against every fighter one-on-one, -on -one, waves of characters come at you, with each one becoming progressively harder to defeat. Don't get me wrong, it is fun, but I enjoyed All-Star more like it used to be. Customization of Amiibo and Mii Fighters are back, which is nice, but I don't really take advantage of these modes. The training mode has been given more depth, and to just name a couple of additions, you can now more accurately determine character launch stats via a graph, as well as move frame by frame. For a casual player, these probably won't mean much, but to advanced players, this is a very nice welcome. The challenge wall has been changed up a bit, and I find it easier to complete than in previous titles. I just wish there were more of them. Online mode selection is pretty much the same, however instead of preset scenarios, your own rules are set and finding players with similar settings is prioritized, which makes it seem like it has a better pick up and go feeling than Smash 4. Quick play has you battling against random players with either yours or your opponent's preferred rule settings. Battle Arenas is a mode where you can battle against your friends as well as random players. Both modes are similar, however Quick Play has an additional element called GSP, or Global Smash Power. This is basically your online ranking. Oh, you're really the more GSP that guy. you have, the better. If you have 1 million GSP on a certain character, that supposedly means you are better than 999,999 other players. Usually you'll get matched up with someone with a similar GSP to yours to help keep things fair-ish. Now if you're really good, you can unlock Elite Smash. This is Ooh, only obtainable by nice getting a minimum night. GSP. As of this review, the minimum GSP to unlock Elite Smash is just over 4 million. This oh, number nice. will continue to climb as more and more people join online mode. I should have tried to unlock Elite Mode when the game first came out, because, as of this review, I haven't been able to get there. The highest I've gotten is 3.93 million with Young Link. <sighs> I'll get it one day. Super Smash Bros. Ultimate lives up to its name as the amount of quality content provided is outstanding. While it has a few quirks I wish were ironed out, and its lack of a few modes like Target Smash, Home Run Contests, and a dedicated event mode is a bit disappointing, the core playstyle of what matters most delivers a smashing experience. It's a graphically beautiful game, and with a large assortment of variables and customization to keep matches exciting, a handful of fun modes to test your skills, a lengthy yet enjoyable adventure mode to keep you occupied for hours, an online mode that appeals to casual and advanced players, a treasure trove of music and spirits to collect, and DLC packs to further enhance the awesomeness, this is the ultimate Smash experience. This game gets a 4.75 out of 5 with the title of Epic.
Did anybody guess this game? No. From the hint? Oh, no. Okay. Um, well, it's a little past 10. Yeah, I need to head back. Okay. Um, do you want to do one more, or do you want to stop? It's only five minutes. All right, we'll do this one. All right, here we go. It's time oh, wait, for the arrow pause? review. So, someone asks, uh, would you give the game a five out of five now with all the DLC? <sighs> I think from how much you get out of the game, yes. But me personally, I only give that score when it when it's a game I just love. Mm. And I love Smash, but it's not enough to get me to that next level. That's fair. For the Nintendo Switch. I remember looking through the Nintendo eShop hoping to find a good deal on something new. Don't get me wrong, there are plenty of deals just about, if not every day, but too many can present you with the paradox of choice. However, I found this game and decided to give it a try. Was it worth it? Let's find out. If you know me, I highly enjoy rhythm games, so I was surprised to find out that I had never heard of this game, even though at the time of this review, it had been out for nearly two years on other platforms. The concept is simple, yet challenging. You're an on-rail ship that must fly from point A to point B, all the while playing a song, so to speak, in the form of tracking ribbons. Ribbons are neon lines that release the music when you fly through them. They will bend and spiral in specific patterns as they pertain to each song. You move the ship with the left analog stick, and trying to track the ribbons can be harder than it looks. No matter the patterns of the ribbons, they are all located on the outer circle of where you can move your ship. This is a good thing because if they were anywhere else, or more specifically, if they were located anywhere between the center of the screen and the outer circle of where you can move your ship, it would become superfluously difficult as your ship will recenter itself by default if you let go of the analog stick. The ribbons are important for several reasons, including releasing the music, obtaining a high multiplier, and staying alive. You can't not follow the ribbons and expect to complete the level. Following ribbons is only half the battle, literally. Many enemies will pop up on screen, and you'll have to shoot them down before they get you. Defeating enemies isn't too hard once you get the hang of it. What I mean is, you'll have to lock onto an enemy with the right analog stick and press ZR to shoot them down. Your ship has a limited number of lock-ons, so you'll have to coordinate which enemies and their projectiles need to be taken down first. Another challenge is when your ship actually fires onto enemies. Every element of the game is about the music. You need to time your shots so they match with the beat of the song, otherwise it can take a bit for the enemies to blow up after you fire your shots. The game rewards you with extra points though if you match your shots with the beats. The real challenge of the game comes when you try to follow ribbons while simultaneously shooting down enemies. That's yeah. You won't find yeah, this too is. much on normal difficulty, but you definitely will in higher tiers. There's a handful of songs that have physical, rhythmic obstacles that you must maneuver around. I really enjoyed them, and the only downside is that not every song has these challenges. One annoyance is your reticle won't show up unless you move the right analog stick. This is annoying because many times enemies will show up dead center of the screen, yet your ship won't lock onto them because you haven't moved the stick yet. Now I know it wouldn't be fair for the reticle to constantly sit in the middle of the screen, as enemies who show up in the middle would be locked onto immediately, but to fix this, enemies shouldn't appear in the center to begin with. Yeah, that's what When I they was do, thinking. it can feel like you're fighting a bit with the reticle, because all you have to do is flick the analog stick to make it appear and lock on, but it wants to move back to the center of the screen and disappear when you let go. At the end of the level, you'll be awarded with a certain amount of stars based on how many points you earned. Your total points are determined by ribbon accuracy and how many enemies you took down. In addition to enemies, semi-hidden red lights scattered throughout each level are fun to find and shoot down. However, you only get a small window of opportunity to do so. Many times the song will be over, and so you think you're finished, and- Oh shoot, I missed that one! Gotta restart, hold on a second. <laughs> so loud, oh, jeez Louise. <laughs> so the main element of this game is, of course, the music. All of it is a mixture of different subgenres of EDM, but mostly dubstep, drum and bass, and chill out. If that's not your bag, man, then you might not enjoy it as much as those who get their freak on with these songs. Okay, Bart I'll admit, Simpson. I'm not a huge fan of dubstep, but after playing some dubstep levels, it kind of works and you start to feel the groove. Graphically, it doesn't look as good as, say, on the PS4 or PC. However, I feel like performance would suffer if they kept the visuals like they are on the other platforms. So it's good in that sense, however, there are some areas you can't help but notice the downgrade. There's actually a few boss fights which add some flair to the mix. 
These bad boys are fun to take down, and I thought it was clever how if you don't defeat them in time, you'll receive a different outcome, like with this giant worm, you'll be eaten by it if you don't kill it. The game is surprisingly generous though when it comes to progressing through the list of songs. You don't actually have to defeat a boss to unlock more songs, all you need are enough stars, and it honestly doesn't take that much to do so. I'd say the biggest problem with the game is the load times. Now if you lose your three lives during a song and restart, it's not too long of a wait. However, when first choosing a song, you'll be waiting for it to load usually between 30 and 45 seconds. Like really? That's ridiculous. The Switch version gives you all I the DLC up front, which includes six additional songs, totaling the list of 21 songs and more ships. The ships don't play differently from one another, but it's still nice to have. Arrow is a fun, unique rhythm game experience. It's nice to come across a rhythm game that focuses on the analog input more so than the digital. I hope it gains ground to the point where the developers will either add more DLC or even a sequel. 21 songs of mostly dubstep and drum and bass isn't enough to keep me coming back to it as much as I have done with other rhythm games like Frequency and the two Amplitude games. Arrow only has a few songs that I really enjoyed, but that doesn't make the game bad as someone who enjoys dubstep and drum and bass more than I do would probably like this game even more. It's still a nice change up to the rhythm genre, and one I think you should give a try. This game gets a 3.75 out of 5 with a title of Good. VSR voids. Oh, I, I I hardly remember this review. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Uh, why why do you refer to all electronic music as EDM, which is electronic dance music? It is that really just like the the EDM is the overarching umbrella of all the subgenres. Well, but that's kind of weird to me because not all of it, not all electronic music is music that you necessarily dance to is it i mean some of it is just kind of like music you chill to yeah chill core is one of them or chill ambient is under edm but it's not music you dance to but so it, why it, is it under that umbrella it just is i, I mean it, it's like a subgenre of a subgenre that's weird to me so anyway Okay. Sanic jump scare. Sanic jump scare, yes. Well, thanks again for watching, um, coming to the stream with us, guys. Appreciate it. Uh, look for the next uh, announcement video in the YouTube shorts. Hope those are working. And uh, which I want to see which ones we're going to get to mm. next uh, time. Bolt Mouse asks, uh, favorite DLC character? Uh, I would say mine is Pyra and Mithra. Oh, I don't know if I have one. Um, we're going to start with VSR. And 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Somewhere between, somewhere in here, we're probably going to finish, which means we're coming up to the end. Uh, actually, you know what? We might, we might go a little, we might not watch as many, just so that the last stream isn't mm. just a few reviews. Um, I'm hopeful that the review I'm working on right now is going to be the last one of this entire series. We will, see, we may see, um, but no promises. But anyway, that's it for now. Look for the YouTube short announcement, and thanks again for uh, coming by. We'll see you next time. Bye, guys.